Radio New Zealand News on National Radio, I'm Chris Witter. A 30-year-old Levin man who sought psychiatric help on 10 occasions but was turned away each time has today been convicted of rape in the High Court in Palmerston North. Morning at four, here's Radio New Zealand News on National Radio. I'm Aaron Sinclair. The Health Minister has ordered an inquiry into the case of a Levin man who unsuccessfully sought psychiatric help. And coincidentally, Shell Oil International, which was attacked for its role and attitude to human rights in Nigeria, has just issued a new set of business principles in which human rights are now included. And just one other bit of business news this morning. Securities commissions banned any advertising by the Savannah Ostrich Processing Company. The company says in its view it's offering securities to the public which are not authorised and don't comply with the Securities Act. Savannah is, prom- is promoting investment in the ostrich in- industry and is owned by Aucklander Victor John Laghetti. We'll have a business update for you at 7.35 just after sport. The bird this week is the North Island Kiwi. Well, today he wanted help. He asked ten times but was turned away. The Jack Parkey story has once again exploded the mental health debate back into the public arena. This on Morning Report. Radio New Zealand News with Hewitt Humphrey. Good morning. The Health Minister has ordered an investigation into the case of a Levin man who sought psychiatric help on ten occasions over a seven-week period last year but was turned away each time. 30-year-old Jack O'Parkey was yesterday convicted of rape in the High Court in Palmerston North after admitting charges of unlawful sexual connection and sexual violation by rape. Stephen Hewson reports. Parkey's lawyer Mike Antonovic says in January last year a family court judge ordered Parkey be admitted for compulsory inpatient care for psychiatric problems. However, he was released a day later. Health Minister Bill English says he's been pulling together the facts of the case and will be asking the Director of Mental Health to investigate what went wrong. Mr English says he's particularly concerned by the issue that the offender was meant to have six months of compulsory treatment but only had one night and he's also worried Mr Parkey tried to admit himself but was turned away. Mike Antonovic says the case is a sad indictment of the health system. This is Stephen Hewson. An uncertain calm has settled on Papua New Guinea following the standoff between Prime Minister Sir Julius Chan and his Army Commander Brigadier General Jerry Singirok. Eric Frickberg reports the General has been sacked and may go on trial and the Prime Minister is insisting he's in charge. Sir Julius Chan lost no time in battling as challenger. He first sacked, then denounced General Singerok for insubordination verging on treason and demanding the Prime Minister's resignation in a row over the Bougainville mercenaries. Sir Julius says democracy was at stake. The dismissal of the General has been accepted with reluctance by his soldiers and there are reports of tension in the barracks. Meanwhile, the mercenaries who'd been detained by the rebels have now been freed. The government says their training programme for Bougainville is back on track. This is Eric Frickberg. Bulldozers have begun clearing the site where Israel intends building thousands of Jewish homes on occupied land in Arab East Jerusalem. The earth-moving gear is flanked by thousands of heavily armed Israeli soldiers who have been told to expect Palestinian protests. Lise Doucette reports the area has been declared a closed military zone. When the bulldozers cleared land on one side of this hilltop, Palestinians staged a sit-in on the other. They set up five tents overnight as many and as close as Israel would let them. They were a few kilometers away from these first bulldozers, but Israeli commanders are now asking them to move their tents even further away. The Palestinians have refused. Israeli peace activists have been visiting the tent site to show their support. Some Arab Israeli students tried to make their way there. There were some minor scuffles when Israeli troops wouldn't let them through. Lise Doucet in Jerusalem. The highest official ever to defect from North Korea is reported to have flown from China to an undisclosed hideaway in the Philippines in an operation shrouded in secrecy. Charles Scanlon reports that Pyongyang's top ideologue, Huang Jang-yop, had taken refuge in the South Korean mission in Beijing nearly five weeks ago. The defector was finally smuggled out of Beijing after more than a month of negotiations between South Korea and China. The South Koreans had wanted Huang Jang-yop to go directly to Seoul, 
But China insisted that he go via a third country out of consideration for the feelings of its North Korean allies. Officials in Seoul have refused to confirm the reports that the defector was flown to an airfield north of the Philippine capital, Manila. But they say he is now secure and under their control with the cooperation of a third country. The secrecy is due to continuing concern for Mr Huang's safety. South Korean officials are not convinced the North has accepted the defection and they're anxious to guard against the possibility of an attack. Charles Scanlon reporting from Seoul. Fifty passengers and crew aboard a Russian airliner are dead after it crashed en route to Turkey. It's the worst domestic air disaster for Russia's troubled airline industry in more than a year. An airline spokesperson says the charter Stavropol Airlines AN24 crashed near the North Caucasus town of Cherkesk 37 minutes after taking off from Stavropol in South Russia. Experts say Russia's air safety standards have fallen since Soviet monopoly Aeroflot was split into hundreds of smaller domestic companies after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Aviation officials say 219 people died last year in 43 air accidents in Russian airspace. Public health officials throughout the country are on alert after the latest meningitis outbreak. A man is dead and another is seriously ill with the disease. The outbreak's linked to a party at the Pegasus Arms in Christchurch after the New Zealand Track and Field Championships on March the 9th. Eileen Cameron reports. The country's in the grip of a meningitis epidemic which has been growing increasingly worse since 1991, with 500 cases and 18 deaths last year alone. With the new outbreak, health officials and Athletics New Zealand are both attempting to track down people who've been in contact with the two infected men. That includes athletes in Australia and Western Samoa. So far, about 160 people have been given preventive antibiotics. Health authorities are urging people suffering possible symptoms of the disease to get medical help immediately. Symptoms may initially seem like the flu and include headaches, fevers and rashes. This is Eileen Cameron. Winston Peters will tonight begin defending himself against claims he's in contempt of Parliament and is also facing pressure on another front. The Privileges Committee will meet to hear evidence relating to an altercation between Mr Peters and John Banks, an event that's been followed by a plunge in Mr Peters' fortunes in the latest opinion poll. Catherine Street reports. Alliance leader Jim Anderton has two complaints about the behaviour of New Zealand First MPs referred to Parliament's Privileges Committee. They relate to the late-night altercation in Parliament's corridors involving Mr Peters and Mr Banks and To Henare and a Radio New Zealand journalist. The incident appears to be reflected in the latest TVNZ Colmar Brunton poll, which shows support for their party is at its lowest point in almost four years. The poll of 1,000 voters taken last week shows New Zealand First support has dropped three points to just 4%. And Winston Peters' popularity in the preferred Prime Minister stakes is also dropping to 4%. The Privileges Committee meeting will be held in open session unless committee members vote tonight to exclude the media. From Parliament, Catherine Street. The New Zealand section of Amnesty International says it's disturbed by a suggestion that New Zealand should follow Australia in dealing with asylum seekers. Immigration Minister Max Bradford says New Zealand should look to Australia for guidance on the issue. Australia has a policy of automatically detaining asylum seekers who don't have prior authorisation. Amnesty's refugee coordinator Bill Smith says he's been meeting the minister and Mr Bradford is serious about making some changes. Um, we made it equally clear that whatever he does, um, he must uh, observe certain international standards. Well, we believe he should, um, or New Zealand's reputation internationally will suffer. Bill Smith says the minister is right in saying it takes too long to deal with asylum applications, but should concentrate on reducing the waiting times rather than following the Australian model. New Zealand junior water polo rep Anthony Culwick has overturned a ban for using an, Ill an illegal substance. Culwick was banned for two years by the International Swimming Federation after testing positive for salbutamol at the World Junior Championships in France in 1995. He's had asthma for years and used a Ventolin inhaler containing the substance without telling the proper authorities. The Court of Arbitration for Sport in Switzerland says Culwick was neither a cheat nor a liar and was misinformed by the New Zealand Swimming Federation about having to give prior notice of using the substance. It ordered that the International Swimming Federation pay him about $4,000. The International Red Cross has launched an internet lottery and plans to use the profits for its humanitarian work around the world. 
Plus Lotto on the World Wide Web will have a weekly draw with an estimated initial jackpot of one and a half million dollars. The Red Cross says players can win money and have fun while helping it to deliver much-needed services to the world's most vulnerable people. And that's the news. Have your say on the issues. Every Friday morning around 10 minutes to 9, the Morning Report team will air listeners' views on the news. If you have an opinion on the latest news events and it's one you'd like to share, then simply write to Feedback, Box 123, National Radio Wellington, or fax us on 04 474 1454. Have your say on the issues with Feedback, every Friday on Morning Report at 10 minutes to 9, here on National Radio. The weather in Auckland today, cloudy periods, the odd western shower, southwesterlies, a maximum of 21 degrees. In Wellington, fine, northerlies, 35 kilometres an hour developing, a maximum of 18 degrees. Christchurch, fine, northeast winds, 19. And Dunedin, fine, westerlies, 30 kilometres an hour, a maximum of 15 degrees. It's almost 10 past seven. Thank you, Hewitt. Morning report with Eva Radich and Mike Hosking. The mental health system under fire again this morning with the health minister ordering an investigation into the case of a Levin man who repeatedly was turned away when he sought psychiatric help last year. Ten recorded visits to the Levin Community Health Centre turned him away every time. Stole his mother's car, drove to Palmerston North to try and get help. They turned him away. His name is Jack Parkey, 30-year-old. Yesterday he was in court convicted of rape. This is in Palmerston North in the High Court after admitting charges of unlawful sexual connection and sexual violation by rape. His lawyer, Mike Antonovic, says the system ignored him and allowed him to commit a crime that should never have happened. He's with us. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. You've seen things like this before. Is this one out of the bag or are there plenty of people out there like this? Uh, My own personal experience is probably limited to this one, but uh, from what I hear, there are probably other examples of this type of thing, but perhaps not quite so serious. Is there any doubt that he's sick and needs help? Oh, there is no doubt about that at all, Mike. He's been um, diagnosed with a serious mental illness, bipolar affective disorder, since 1985. Polar affective disorder, as I understand it, is manic depression. Is that Uh, right or wrong? That is another uh, term for it, yes. Okay. Characterised by a series of episodes of highs or lows. Back in January, he was committed for psychiatric help. There seems to be some sort of doubt as to uh, how and why that happened. What can you tell us? Well, I can, all I can tell you is what emerges from reading the medical records. And the medical records show that on the 12th of January 1996, the clear opinion of the medical experts um, treating him was that he needed long-term medical inpatient care. Um, On the 25th of January, there was an order made by the district court or a family court judge in uh, Palmerston North, or Levin, committing him under the Mental Health Act to a psychiatric hospital for inpatient treatment for a term of six months. And he was tipped out the next day. Why? Well, I don't know. Um, I can only speculate as to the reason why. Uh, Perhaps they didn't uh, have enough beds available at that stage. Um, All I can tell you is that a court ordered that he be detained as an inpatient one day. He was taken there and tipped out. Does he, is he capable of explaining why in that sense? Is he, is that possible for him to do that or he doesn't know either? Mr Parkey? Yeah. No, I I don't think he knows either. All I know then is that he made, as you say, those ten repeated visits asking to be taken back in. Is he, is he, see, what I'm trying to find out here, and we're going to be talking to Bill English and uh, various mental health experts about uh, this, I mean, it seems unusual, does it not? You can knock on the door ten times, get turned away every time, and part of the problem, as I understand it, is he has a drinking and a drug problem, uh, and th- th- they've told him it's not a place to dry out. That's correct. This sort of facility. Is he a person that you would deal with and think to yourself, well, maybe he's just got a booze problem? Well, no, they knew all about him because he's been a patient since 1985. They would have had his medical records and they would have known too that the treatment of his particular condition is greatly hampered uh, by alcohol and drugs. So I suppose we have a situation where he's tipped back into the community. He was receiving ongoing treatment in the form of medication and they know that as uh, as a result of him being back in the community, and using drugs and or alcohol, um, his treatment has been severely impaired and he's asking to come back in and they keep saying no. 
All right, just stay with us, will you? We uh, that defence uh, counsel, the crown prosecutor in this case, was Ben Vanderkalk, who's with us. Good morning. Good morning. So, what do you make of all of this? Because we have the twist in the story, uh, mad or bad. This is the Jenny Shipley argument all over again, isn't he? Does this guy deserve to be in prison? for rape or does he deserve to be in a psychiatric institution for treatment? Well it's clear Mike that he requires um, treatment and two eminent psychiatrists have agreed on that and uh, that was the issue that was before the High Court yesterday. There is however a residual crown concern that that there is no facility in New Zealand to both punish someone and to uh, treat them for a serious psychiatric illness. Can you punish and treat successfully? Well um, in New Zealand there is no facility to do that. But if you built one could you do it? I mean, is it just a lack of a facility or it simply can't be done? You either need to treat these people or they're criminals and need to be punished. Well, you see, there is, there is a punitive element to be considered in every case um, in, in, in terms of punishment. Um, there is no reason why an adequate institution couldn't be built that uh, is a secure institution that meets the need to deprive a person of his liberty for serious offending and to compel a person to be treated. Under the current regime, there is no way under the criminal justice system that a person can be compelled to be treated. That's what Jack Parkey needed. He needed to be compelled to be treated. So how far, as a lawyer, would you go down that track to argue punishment over treatment? Well, my, my, I suppose my personal view as a lawyer is that punishment should be um, at the, uh, given at the same time as treatment. But given that we can't, though? Well, that's why the, we had the um, debate in Paris North yesterday for the court to exercise a discretion to allow this man to be admitted to compulsory treatment. Have you seen this sort of case before? No, I don't, I don't recall it happening like this before. So it's possible this is just one out of the bag? I hope so. Appreciate your time. That's Ben Vanderkolk, who is the uh, Crown Prosecutor there. Uh, Mike Antunabek, who let him down? Oh, I, I don't think there's any doubt that he was let down, and I think the, you could argue too that the victim was seriously let down as well. Uh, This was a crime that, in my opinion, need not have happened at all uh, had the psychiatric health services been adequately equipped uh, to properly treat this man. Do we know why he committed the crime? Was it because he couldn't control himself or because he needed to commit a crime to get the help he was seeking? No, the suggestion that he needed to commit this crime has never been made and certainly wasn't, uh, to my understanding, ever any part of the Crown or the police case against him. The evidence was clear. Um, uncontested or not in dispute between the two psychiatrists that at the time of the incident um, he was in a hypomanic state and that meant that he was unable to read the signals that the woman was giving him. Uh, He he made errors of of judgment and that's exactly what happens when one is in that state. So you can only say, I suppose, that the health services let him down. Appreciate your time. Mike and Tunnevik there. Now, a couple of people to talk about this later on in the programme. After 7.30, this is Dr Peter McGeorge we'll be talking to, who's a consultant psychologist with the Mental Health Foundation. And uh, the investigation, as announced by Bill English, Health Minister Bill English, a lot of questions need to be answered. He will be with us on the programme after 8. 17 past 7. An uneasy truce has settled over Papua New Guinea following an unprecedented showdown between Prime Minister Sir Julius Chan and his Army Commander, Brigadier General Jerry Singerock. The General has now been sacked and may be put on trial. The Prime Minister is insisting he's in charge, but in the barracks, some soldiers are unhappy. The issue that sparked the crisis has gone full circle. The deployment of mercenaries on Bougainville Island is officially back on course now. Here's Eric Frickberg. The threat to his authority brought Sir Julius Chan out fighting. General Singerok had earlier given the Prime Minister 48 hours to quit, but in swift moves Sir Julius sacked the rebel general and went on to denounce him in scathing terms at a press conference in Port Moresby. The former commander is guilty of gross insubordination and bordering on treason with his decision to go public without consulting the government first. Sir Julius said democracy was at stake and had to be defended. The people will not be stood over by any member of the disciplinary forces. The disciplinary forces are here to serve the government and the people of this country. The Prime Minister's dismissal of General Singerok and his replacement by the acting commander, Colonel Alfred Aikung, had early been accepted, though reluctantly, by the General's military aide, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Fabila. 
Obviously, there's uh, there's some uh, there's some animosity against the government's decision, um, uh, but the the commander has pleaded uh, uh, to them uh, that uh, we must allow the normal democratic processes to uh, to occur. Some press reports from Port Moresby indicate that many soldiers will go along with this only reluctantly. One report quoted a soldier as saying he'll do anything his commander tells him to, including fight the government if necessary. The official view, though, is upbeat. Sir Julius Chan's chief press officer, Mark Lilliman, views the crisis as essentially over. The police are definitely in full support of the government. Uh, the acting commander is in place and apparently the, the military has a very good rapport with him. Uh, apparently there, there are some dissenting voices uh, in some sections. However, they are in the minority and that's not a political spin. And... Um, that, that's the latest information. The majority of the, the military is calm in their barracks and supporting the new commander, Colonel Alfred Eichung. This whole issue arose after the government hired South African mercenaries to help win the eight-year war over Bougainville. The army objected that the $40 million cost could have been better spent paying and equipping their own troops. During the army revolt, the mercenaries were confined to barracks. Mark Lilliman says they've now been released and their mission will proceed. Everything is still as planned. I think the, their training, etc., is still planned uh, to go ahead and uh, to continue as before. It's generally a training for a rapid deployment force and um, special forces that are able to focus on particular uh, areas that are of difficulty, such as the, the ongoing crisis, 10 years worth, and uh, 200 military deaths and, and uh, many thousands of uh, other deaths over the last 10 years. General Singerok, meanwhile, says he plans to continue the fight against the use of mercenaries on Bougainville. He may, though, face trial for his defiance of the government. Sir Julius Chan says the process of the law will now take over, but he gave no details about how this would happen. For Morning Report, Eric Frickberg. We're joined now by our correspondent in Port Moresby, Peter Nisi. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Well, you heard the official government line there, Peter. Everything is calm, the incident is totally over. What's, what's your perspective on that? Well, um, the Murray Barracks, where um, the former commander was, is still very much close to the public. Um, no one's coming out, no one's going in. And so while the instruments have been delivered and so forth, no one really knows for sure what's really happening in there other than that a change of command has taken place. So we've got no idea just how much loyalty there is to the Brigadier General? There's obviously been a split in loyalty. Um, I'm not sure that uh, Mark Lilliman's assessment is correct. Like I said, um, no one has been able to independently go into Mari Barracks, neither has anyone been able to go into Taurama or at Moem Barracks in Wewek, where the Sandline International um, uh, consultants are being kept. What about the atmosphere generally in Port Moresby yesterday? The atmosphere generally has been very calm. Everyone's basically going about their normal business of the day. Um, everyone has, I mean, especially the um, Defence Force, they've heeded what uh, the former commander, Jerry Singerok, has said and have basically maintained calm and order and just remained within barracks as he instructed. Singerok says he'll continue the fight against the use of the mercenaries, though. He says he wants to disclose the details of the corrupt, that's what his words, 35 million sand line deal. Do we know how he plans to go about that? He hasn't indicated, but yesterday I heard that um, there were some lawyers um, who were going to be in touch with him to see if they can pursue this any further acting on his behalf. Um, that could be one way it's done. There seems to be no... Um, no one's really taken heed of his call for a commission of inquiry or, or an investigation of some sort. Um, when the question was to put to Prime Minister Sir Julius Chen yesterday, he said that there are existing avenues already through the Ombudsman Commission or the Attorney General's office, but before they can pursue it any further, um, there should be some more proof about the whole deal as, um, first. What about the possibility of a treason charge against Singerok? That's a high possibility, as um, Sir Julius said. He described it as gross insubordination leaning towards um, treason. And so there's a high possibility that that would happen. But the problem with that kind of a charge is that um, Singerok, you know, in, on, on his favour, 
stepped down willingly after a bit of standoff, and really the push for attrition charges, which at the moment, according to some lawyers, there's no grounds for, um, could lead to problems because um, the military may not take that too favorably, given the fact that their former commander stepped down willingly. Thank you very much for that. That's our correspondent in Port Moresby, Peter Nacy. Takes it to 24 past seven. Well, you're young, you're healthy, you're an athlete, you're doing personal bests, and then you're dead. Meningitis. Health authorities say the latest outbreak highlights an epidemic which is threatening the country. As I mentioned, one man has died, another is in hospital after an outbreak linked to a party at the Pegasus Arms Hotel after the National Track and Field Championships in Christchurch. Efforts are being made to track down people who have been in contact with both the men already. Up to 160 people have been given preventative antibiotics. The difficulty is it's not known how many more could be at risk. Our reporter Eileen Cameron looks at the outbreak and the present situation with the disease. It's officially an epidemic. The number of cases of meningitis have been increasing since 1991, with 500 cases last year alone, 18 of them fatal. The outbreak in Christchurch has put public health officials on alert throughout the country. Canterbury Medical Officer of Health Mal Breesman says the precise source is not known, but party goers were sharing glasses and bottles, which is a risky activity. In fact, the issue was we ran a campaign last year on called Don't Share Spit, but it was aimed at people who share uh, drinks and cigarettes at parties or at sporting functions, and that's one of the reasons why we're concerned about this particular situation. There was apparently a lot of it. Mel Breesman says people who may have been exposed need to be aware of the symptoms. The initial symptoms may well be just flu-like symptoms, but uh, then uh, the headache becomes more severe and uh, often a rash develops. The event was at the Pegasus Arms on March the 9th at the end of the track and field meeting. Proprietor David Clark says there's no suggestion his bar is at fault. The possibility of, of, um, that the infection was spread while patrons were on our premises is, is there, um, but there's absolutely no suggestion uh, that the infection originated here and that, um, that uh, it's an overwhelming probability that it was brought in by a patron. Meanwhile, Athletics New Zealand is facing a huge task as it tries to contact all those who were involved in the meet. Chief Executive John Cameron says they're doing everything possible to get the warning out. Our whole process is really um, to make everyone aware of um, meningitis, and that is through um, our team coaches, through um, athletes themselves who have uh, forwarded a uh, newsletter to those that we have on a database. Uh, through our centres, which are 11 centres throughout New Zealand, to um, become aware of it. John Cameron says the contacting process extends overseas with six Western Samoan competitors at the event. He says they've also had three athletes go to Australia for a meet, one of whom was the flatmate of the young man who died, Vance Lata. There's no second chances with this. It's, it's a very serious disease and um, we're being as cautious as we can do. Health authorities also recommend the cautious approach. Anyone who may have been infected should seek medical help swiftly if they start experiencing possible symptoms. For Morning Report, Eileen Cameron. We're joined now by Director of Public Health, Gillian Durham. Good morning. Good morning. 500 cases last year. This looks like a very serious problem. Well, there are actually 474, but the rate for 1996 was 14 cases of meningococcal disease per 100,000 population compared with 11.7 per 100,000 population in 1995. And the rate has been going up every year since 1991, and we have not yet peaked. And do we know why? Well, we don't fully understand um, the situation. We have uh, in New Zealand a strain uh, that is responsible for... Uh, nearly 80% of our cases, and that has become established in the 90s. Uh, it seems that when you have high levels of meningococcal disease like this in the population, about a third of the population are probably carrying the germ. Uh, they're healthy carriers, and they're carrying the germ at the back of their nose and throat. For some reason, in some people, uh, the germ invades and they get meningococcal disease, either meningitis or septicemia. And we don't know why some people get sick and others just carry it. Well, we know there are some risk factors, and some of those include living in crowded conditions, being exposed to environmental tobacco smoke, uh, people who've had a, a recent respiratory illness, um, those who are from a lower socioeconomic group, um, people from a particular ethnic group, and there are also climatic factors involved. 
You've said this is a particular strain that hasn't peaked yet. How long do these strains last? Well, unfortunately, when other countries like New Zealand have experienced this situation, the problem can continue for 5 to 15 years, which is why we're having to focus on public education, professional education and a research programme. What about preventive care? What can you do there? Well, the key message, um, given that for this particular germ there is no vaccine currently available, the key message is public education, that is, if anybody knows anybody who has a rash and fever and they're very sick, they should get to their doctor straight away because antibiotics can save lives and the message is don't wait, take action, see your doctor. So that's the, the public education. From the professional education point of view, we are encouraging doctors to treat this as an emergency. If they suspect anybody has meningococcal disease, they should do the tests and get them on antibiotics very quickly and before they transfer that person to hospital. The antibiotics don't always work, though, do they? In some cases, this can be a very, very fulminant, rapidly deteriorating disease, and there just is not time uh, for the antibiotics to work. But remembering of last year when we had 474 people with this disease, there were 18 deaths. Um, that means that less than 5% of people with the disease die and that the rest of, of uh, people respond well to antibiotics. So don't delay, take action. Thank you very much for that. Gillian Durham, who is the Director of Public Health, right on 7.30. More on the Jack Parkey story in the next half hour. What is it about the mental health system in this country that allows these sort of things to happen? I called him a psychologist, no good. Psychiatrist is what I was looking for. Mental Health Foundation psychiatrist, Dr Peter McGeorge, with us in the next half hour. I'm also about to go and get in uh, touch with Bill English on your behalf and uh, put the questions that need answering to him, so we'll have that after eight. Also, Roger Sari, there's much talked about Wisconsin welfare program that uh, has been dominating the minds of the people people at the Beyond Dependency Conference in Auckland. Bit of detail on what the government are going to do. What are the actual changes? Roger Sowry, Minister of Social Welfare, with us in the next 30 minutes. News now with Hewitt Humphrey. The lawyer for a Levin man convicted of rape says the offence would not have happened if the man's appeals for psychiatric help had been answered. 30-year-old Jack O'Parkey was yesterday convicted of rape in the High Court in Palmerston North. Two months before that, he'd been committed to spend six months in a psychiatric hospital, but was discharged after a day. He then sought psychiatric help ten times, but was turned away each time. His lawyer, Mike Antanovic, told Morning Report that the mental health system failed his client and his victim. Health Minister Bill English has ordered an investigation into the case and will be talking to the Director of Mental Health to find out what went wrong. The Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Sir Julius Chan, says he's in absolute control of the nation. He told a news conference that after two days of political turmoil, the institution of democracy is very much alive in PNG. Sir Julius defied a call by the Army Chief Brigadier General Jerry Singirock that he resign for hiring mercenaries to help fight the rebels on Bougainville. The Prime Minister says the General's actions was gross insubordination and he's been sacked. He says the mercenaries who'd been detained by the mutinous soldiers have been freed and their mission on Bougainville will go ahead. Hundreds of Israeli troops are standing guard as bulldozers move in to level the ground for a new Jewish settlement in disputed East Jerusalem. The building is going ahead despite Palestinian warnings that the project will spark violence and destroy the peace process. Soldiers and paramilitary police have been deployed around the hilltop construction site at Jebel Abu Ghraim to keep protesters at bay. Palestinians claim Israel is building the settlement as part of a broader initiative to isolate Jerusalem from the Palestinian West Bank. New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters will tonight begin defending himself against claims that he's in contempt of Parliament. The Privileges Committee will meet to hear evidence relating to a late-night altercation between Mr Peters and John Banks. Alliance leader Jim Anderton has complained about Mr Peter's behaviour and also laid a complaint that New Zealand First Deputy Leader Toe Henry tried to stop a Radio New Zealand journalist recording the incident. Meanwhile, a TVNZ Colmar Brunton poll shows support for New Zealand First has sunk to 4%, its lowest ever level. Public health officials throughout the country are on alert after the latest meningitis outbreak. One man is dead and another is seriously ill with the disease. The outbreak is linked to a party in Christchurch after the New Zealand Track and Field Championship on March the 9th. Athletics New Zealand and health officials are trying to track down people who've been in contact with the two infected men. 
Health authorities say the country's in the grip of a meningitis epidemic which has been getting steadily worse since 1991, with 500 cases and 18 deaths last year. ECNZ says there's no need for panic over the low rainfall so far this year around the South Island hydro lakes. Rainfall in January was a third below average and is down for February and March as well. But ECNZ says levels in the hydro lakes are still healthy and the Met Service says weather patterns are nothing like 1992 when low lakes forced power rationing. Now the weather around the country today in Whangarei, fine 21. Auckland, cloudy periods, the odd shower, 21. Hamilton, Tauranga, fine 20 to 21. Rotorua and Taupo, fine 18 to 19. Gisborne, Napier and Hastings, fine 21 to 22 degrees. New Plymouth and Palmerston North, cloudy periods, 18 to 19. Wanganui, Palmerston North, Nel- Wellington and Nelson, fine 18 to 19. Blenheim, Morning cloud clearing, 21. Greymouth increasing cloud, 17. Christchurch, fine, 19. Queenstown, high cloud, 17. Timaru, fine, 17. Dunedin, fine, 15 degrees. In Vicargill, occasional showers, 16 degrees. And so to a summary of the New Zealand papers. And the New Zealand Herald leads with a High Court ruling which paves the way for councils to levy rates against utilities such as phone booths and post office letterboxes. The Dominion says a mentally ill man who raped a woman in Levin was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for six months, but discharged one day after. In the South, the papers lead with the death of top Otago athlete Vance Latter from meningococcal disease. The press says South Island Athletics has been rocked by the death. The Otago Daily Times reports his flatmates have been checked, along with those who attended a function with him in Christchurch and a party in Wyndham. Still on that story, the Dominion says an athlete who was at the Christchurch function is now seriously ill with meningitis in Wellington Hospital, and health authorities have treated residents at the student hostel where he lives to try to contain an outbreak of the disease. Also in the papers today, the Dominion says the government will introduce a law to get around the Privacy Act so it can immediately cut benefits of people who turn down jobs. The Herald says a West Auckland cemetery is considering eco-burials, which would see the end of coffins and headstones in parts of the cemetery. And those are the papers. Thanks, Hewitt. It takes us to 24 minutes to 8. Time for Sport Now with Andrew Dewhurst. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. There's speculation the All Blacks are to be involved in a new competition. British Lions rugby manager Fran Cotton says moves are afoot to take England and France out of the Five Nations Championship and create an alternative tournament along with Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. Cotton told British newspaper The Daily Mail that there's a small group of influential people in English rugby who wish to break up the Five Nations as they think England will never win the World Cup by being part of the event. And there's tension in the air in Hong Kong as the world's best seven players prepare to battle for the World Cup. New Zealand rep Owen Scrimger says it's obvious this event's being treated a lot more seriously than the usual Hong Kong tournament. You get to know a lot of the players because you seem to turn up at the same tournaments, the same guys every, you know, every couple of weeks. Um, but this one, definitely a lot more at stake at this one and uh, I've, I've just noticed um, a bit more tenseness in the air. Um, not so friendly, you know, amongst the players anymore, just keeps themselves, stuff like that. Wellington golfer Martin Pettigrew is the best-placed New Zealander after two rounds of the Australian Amateur Championships in Perth. Pettigrew is lying second equal on four under par, one shot behind the leader, Wayne Persky of Queensland. Australian cyclist Anna Wilson is expecting plenty of attacks on her lead now that the International Women's Cycle Tour of the Waikato is about to hit the hills. Wilson leads by four seconds from American Didi Demet, with New Zealand's leading hope Jacinta Coleman in fifth place 44 seconds down. New Zealand junior water polo rep Anthony Colwick has been cleared of a drug ban by the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Switzerland. Colwick was banned for two years after testing positive to a banned substance at the World Junior Champs in 1995. Colwick suffered from asthma and used a Ventolin inhaler containing the substance. The court has ruled he was neither a cheat nor a liar and that he'd been misinformed by the New Zealand Swimming Federation on having to give prior notification of using the substance. World swimming authorities have been ordered to pay him about $4,000 in costs. 
and the race to sign German soccer striker Jürgen Klinsmann is about to start. Klinsmann shocked German soccer this morning by announcing he'll be leaving Bayern Munich at the end of the season because he doesn't fit in at Germany's richest club. The decision is almost certain to fuel speculation that he could return to England where he played one season at Tottenham. And that's sport. Thanks, Andrew. 22 to 8, time for our business news or update from the markets, rather, with Giles Beckford. Thank you, Eva. From the Reuters screen, Wall Street, the Dow Jones down 29 points now, 69.29. Investors are described as lying and waiting. They don't seem to be waiting too often, though, to buy New Zealand stocks. Fletcher Building, $4.29. The energy stock, $3.80. Forestry, $1.87. Paper, $2.85. Telecom is $6.31. And Transrail, $8.64. The local share market top 40 index will start today at 22.17. On the foreign exchange, the Kiwi dollar, 69.46 American cents, 88.1 Australian, 43.69 British pence and 85.16 Japanese yen. The trade weighted index at 68.29. And on the money market, the 90-day bills, 7.54%, 10-year bonds, 7.9%. In the business headlines this hour, Transpower and ECNZ have reached an agreement on the contentious issue of paying for the Cook Strait cable, but the matter is still far from being settled. Transpower still has to reach an agreement with the other major electricity generator contact, and the generators in turn have to decide what costs they'll pass on to the power companies. Ratings agency Standard & Poor says it's not concerned by New Zealand's current account deficit as long as the government continues to keep running budget surpluses and paying off debt. The agency has affirmed its AA-plus foreign currency and AAA local currency ratings on the country's long-term debt after the election. Securities Commission has banned any advertising by the Savannah Ostrich Processing Company. The Commission says in its view the company is offering securities to the public which don't comply with the Securities Act. Savannah is promoting investment in the industry and is owned by Aucklander Victor John Laghetti. The board of Australian airline Qantas is reported to be looking at a plan to sell its 20% stake in Air New Zealand. Sydney sharebroking sources say Qantas would sell its 100 million B-class shares for around $3.80 each, possibly to American investors. And finally, shopping mall owner St Luke's Group says it's invited Australian counterpart Westfield Holdings to submit proposals for the management of the entire St Luke's portfolio. Thank you, Giles. Back at lunchtime, 19 to 8 on Morning Report. Well, back to the Jack Parkey story, the question. So many questions are being raised about the ability of the mental health service to provide adequate care for consumers like Jack Parkey, who are also at risk of committing crime. They have the alcohol and drug dependency problems. It seems the more we learn about this story, uh, the more relevant this alcohol and drug dependency problem becomes. Consultant psychiatrist with the Mental Health Foundation, Dr Peter McGeorge, says the service isn't equipped to deal with this growing group of mental consumers or mental health consumers. He's with us. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. Tell me why. If I've got a problem, I can't knock on the door and say I need help, and they say sure. Well, the, the, the reason for it is that they may not have had beds. I mean, it's difficult to comment without um, the, the details being known, but they may not have had beds to be able to keep him in hospital. They may have had other people coming in that they saw took a priority over him. The other thing about it is they may, they're, they're, there's unlikely to have been uh, options for that person with that dual problem of, dual di- of um, alcohol problems and, um, and, and psychiatric disorder. Is there something we could do? It reminds me, last year on this great debate, Mike Moore came up with the, the I suppose, simple idea yep. that we need facilities around the country where you go, literally, knock on the door and say, listen, I need some help. Yes, yeah. Well, those, uh, a lot of those facilities are actually being developed around the country. There, in Auckland, for example, there is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week service. That's the same um, in, in other areas throughout the country. But the thing is that it's one thing to knock on the door. It's another thing to actually have the services that a person can be appropriate um, um, directed towards and this this problem this dual diagnosis problem is is actually a national epidemic and I'm getting a slightly tired of talking about it but 
um, in the sense that I've actually been saying this, I'm on record as saying that, that this particular problem needs urgent attention and it needs attention not just from the mental health services but also from the alcohol and drug services as well. Why is it such or so difficult with the so-called dual problem if you happen to have alcohol or drug dependency problems? Why does that somehow become a complex issue involved in your mental health treatment? Well, the, a lot of these people are very difficult to manage. Um, manic depression is, is a difficult condition to manage anyway. But add to that problems with uh, with addiction, and you really do have a problem. And of course, a lot of them are marginalised within uh, a criminal subculture as well. So, um, not only is the problem difficult to manage clinically, but it's also difficult to manage in terms of just looking after these people. And a lot of um, groups nowadays w- would prefer not to look after these uh, particular people uh, because they create so many problems. So when they say they, they don't have to? So if you, if you knock on my door and uh, I look at you and think, well, you're trouble, I don't want to deal with you, you I can say, well... Well, they'll be, looking, nice they'll be looking at the, at, at the group of people that they're trying to deal with anyway. There's, there's enormous pressure on acute beds uh, throughout the country. But one of the reasons for that is that there aren't the alternative services. My, my own feeling is we have to be very careful about downsizing any of the medium stay beds. Uh, in psychiatric hospitals um, any further. And the other thing is that we desperately need more supervised uh, hostel beds in the community that are adequately staffed with people that really know what they're dealing with and are prepared to do it. Thank you for your time. Dr Peter McGeorge, consultant psychiatrist with the Mental Health Foundation, just completed a very good interview with Bill English. It'll be there for you at about ten past eight. The changes to the work test for beneficiaries will go ahead on the 1st of April amidst problems with the Privacy Act's impact on it. The new work test, which was announced last year, means beneficiaries who don't turn up for interviews or who turn down jobs or training are likely to have their benefits cut. There's a sliding scale of penalties ranging from a 20% cut in a benefit for just one week up to suspending a benefit for 26 weeks. Shades of the controversial Wisconsin welfare program, you might say, with the announcement coming within days of a similar scheme in the US being discussed at the Beyond Dependency Conference being held in Auckland at the moment. For details, we're joined by Social Welfare Minister Roger Sarri. Good morning. Good morning. Who is this aimed at? Singles or right across the board? No, this is aimed at uh, people who are on work-tested benefits. So it's aimed at all people who are on the unemployment benefit, uh, plus people who are on a domestic purposes benefit where their youngest child is 14 or over. Uh, And in in a new move, it also is aimed at the spouse of somebody who is unemployed. We're going to work test them as well, uh, where the as a couple they haven't got any children under 14. That's an entirely new area, isn't it? Yes, that's a new area, as is the domestic purposes benefit where the youngest child is 14 so or, or uh, over. So those are two new areas that we're including in the work test. Why? Well, because we believe that those people um, should be available for work. Uh, in particular, um, uh, the w- work that we've done has shown us that uh, people who have peop- uh, the youngest child of 14 uh, they are able to get back into the workforce. And many of them are very keen to get back into the workforce. And so we're starting, if you like, uh, with the easiest end of the market, the, the end uh, that we the believe we can make the most gains in. That's the, the unemployed, basically. Unemployed and domestic purposes beneficiaries, where, where their youngest is 14 or over. Immediately the prospect of the effect on families comes to mind. Families, obviously, are the most vulnerable and perhaps the most dependent on benefits. If the benefit is cut for whatever reason, the children is going to suffer. They could lose their home. They could not have somebody at home after school. A whole drastic uh, cycle of of effects could occur. Well, we don't we don't anticipate that we'll have to uh, actually cut people's benefits. But in even terms just of a minor them. cut, if you're only but, living on a very very tight income, well, that's right. It's going to have a big effect. That's right. But we what we have to emphasise is these people have responsibilities. Uh, as well as their rights. They have a right to a benefit, but they have a responsibility to uh, to turn up for a job interview. They have a responsibility to turn up for uh, job seeker programs. They have a responsibility to be looking for work, particularly those on an unemployment benefit. One of the conditions of receiving an unemployment benefit uh, is that you are at work uh, work ready, that you are available for work. But the whole so, new area of looking at the DPB and the widows' pensions and the spouses of uh, beneficiaries, that opens up a whole new area, doesn't it? Th- Which that, have not in the past been necessarily ready for work. Yes, that's right. But we believe that those people should be ready for work. And uh, the work that we've been doing uh, with domestic purpose beneficiaries, uh, for example, shows us that the vast majority of them uh, actually are in work in the workforce b- before their youngest child is 14. There are a small... Uh, 
uh, group that seem to think that they have the right to a benefit but not the responsibility to try and move off it. And so we're going to try and work with those people and encourage them to move from the benefit back into the workforce. Now, the, the worst thing you can do is lose your benefit for 13 weeks. What would you have to do to lose your benefit for that long? Uh, you'd have to um, consistently refuse to be available for any of the job seeker programs run by the New Zealand Employment Service. You'd have to consistently refuse to turn up to job interviews and you'd have to turn down jobs when they were offered to you. Now, it's not coincidental you've released the date of this coming in at the same time as the Beyond Dependency Conference is on in Auckland. What other changes are you planning? Well, it is a, it is a little bit coincidental. Uh, this uh, legislation um, for these changes, which come in place on the 1st of April, uh, but well, you must have had it in fact, the pipeline for some time, so why now? Well, well it was passed last year. Yes, the legislation exactly. was passed last year uh, for the 1st of April. So um, the fact that there's a, a conference looking at uh, other ways that we can uh, move people from uh, welfare into the workforce uh, is, is, I have to say, a little bit coincidental. But um, let, let's, let's move to the conference because uh, there are a lot of uh, developments and exciting uh, programs being talked about at the conference uh, from around the world. It is an international conference where people have come together for the first time ever uh, in anywhere in the world. We've got the, this group of people together uh, who are presenting what they are doing in their particular country to move people from welfare into the workforce or training programs. Now what we have to do is look at those ideas uh, and then adapt them uh, where we think they will work for New Zealand. We're not talking about transplanting something from overseas uh, into New Zealand. We're talking about developing programs here for New Zealanders that reflect our values and our cultures. But are there specific things perhaps from the Wisconsin model that you've considered already? Uh, there are, we have looked at the Wisconsin uh, model already. Uh, at, the Wisconsin model is um, still moving to full implementation. So uh, we haven't got anything there that I would at this stage be prepared to say uh, this is what we're going to do. But I mean, you haven't ruled anything out either? No, we haven't. You know, you'd be silly to rule anything out before you've studied it. Thank you very much for your time this morning. It's the Minister of Social Welfare, Roger Sowery. It's 10 to 8. In a crackdown on organised crime throughout the country yesterday, police arrested 50 people. They hoped to get some more and they recovered property and drugs estimated to be worth more than a million dollars. Operation Volpine which is a good word, of or as of the fox crafty aspect or nature, is the result of work by an undercover officer who spent seven months infiltrating an organised crime network based in Auckland and it follows several other successful operations recently. The National Crime and Operations Manager, Assistant Commissioner Ian Holyoke, is with us. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. See, Peter Doon was telling us yesterday about these burglaries and these car thefts. It's largely the same people. So when you crack 50 or 70 people at one time, do you make a huge dent? Well, I would hope so. That, that was certainly our intention in, in this particular operation and in others like that that we run periodically. So does this mean burglary drops? You take oh. 50 to 70 out of circulation and all of a sudden there is a noticeable difference? Uh, I would hope so, and that has happened on previous occasions. But, of course, uh, where there is a void, it's often filled by someone else. Moving How on. professional are these people? If I get put away for a few years, do I have people carrying on the business while I'm out of circulation? Oh. Well, it's, it's hard to measure the professionalism uh, of anyone, let alone criminals, <laughs> but uh, there are certainly instances uh, known to us where people do keep on managing their criminal enterprise from inside prison. But when you're dealing with a million dollars worth of stuff, you've got to be able to channel it somewhere, don't you? You've got to have a system in place where you oh. can unload the cars and the jet skis oh. and the drugs and the clothes and the... Certainly. The, the, these items are sold at uh, in, incredibly low value and I don't imagine they're hard to get rid of. I mean, to, to find... Uh, motor vehicles worth uh, several thousands of dollars sold for a few hundred dollars. It's not hard to get rid of things, but then it's, it ought to be equally obvious to the buyer that it's stolen. This is stolen to order sort of scheme? Uh, I, I couldn't say that. It's hard to tell that. Um, uh, the, the things are on offer, and uh, we certainly went ordering them, but, uh, but our man was able to buy them quite readily, and uh, obviously other people do too. See, Peter Dean also talked about what we need to do is, is have cleverer ways of convincing people not to do it again. Yes. Is that realistic, or is he dreaming? Uh, well, he's my commissioner. I agree with him. <sighs> the d These are professional people. How do you go around convincing them that theft is not a good thing and um, don't do it again? Well, when, when we say professional people, we're, 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 we're not actually talking of professional people as listeners would know it. We're talking of uh, low-life criminals here who are, who are acting in an organised manner. But these are people who make a living out of theft, aren't uh, they? Yeah, yeah. They're professional thieves. Well, yeah, I guess... In, That's in what they do for a living. Yeah, but not professionals like uh, you would describe a lawyer or a doctor. No, indeed not. And but I, how I, would I you convince be... them that a change of career was oh, a smart I, idea? Uh, I think the certainty of apprehension um, is, is one of the things that will, will, will uh, prevent um, 
uh, activity like that. But if certainty of apprehension worked, we wouldn't have a, have a recidivism rate in this country of 66%, would well, we? Well, I, I agree with you, and uh, we've got to get better and smarter at our job. So, so how do we? It. So how, that's what I'm asking. How do we do this? Oh, I, uh, well, we're constantly reviewing our systems, our organisation, our technology, so that we can get better. And uh, you know, I'm optimistic that we will. What about chances of getting this stuff back? You got a million dollars worth of stuff. We have got all that back. We have got the million dollars. Yeah, but where are the owners? Where are the owners who... who, I mean, the whole thing goes through the chain of society, doesn't it? There'll be be these people who claimed on insurance. Yes. Thousands of dollars worth of insurance claims. Where are these people? Where are the owners? How do you get it back? Uh, You mean return it to the owners? Hmm. Well, we we will know uh, almost every item where it it has come from during the course of the, uh, uh, the operation... Uh, we will have, uh, I mean, some of the things are obvious, motor vehicles, it's, it's quite certain who they belong to. We can now go back to the owners of the insurance companies. And um, uh, other items, uh, we know what shops they came from because we've checked on it at the time uh, we've made the purchase. We've backtracked, found out where the crime is, uh, and, and until now we haven't been able to take any action. Appreciate your time this morning. Ian Holyoke, Assistant Commissioner uh, with the National Crime and Operations uh, Unit. He's the manager there. Six to eight. New Zealand First Lady and Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters tonight begins defending himself against claims he's in contempt of Parliament, but he's also facing pressure from another front. This evening, the Privileges Committee meets to hear evidence relating to a confrontation between Mr Peters and MP John Banks, an event that's been followed by a plunge in his political fortunes in the latest opinion poll. Here's Catherine Street. Alliance leader Jim Anderton has succeeded in getting two complaints about the behaviour of New Zealand First MPs to be considered by Parliament's Privileges Committee. Deputy To Henare is joining his leader Winston Peters as the subject of a complaint about a confrontation in the corridor just outside the debating chamber. Jim Anderton wants the committee to consider whether Mr Henare committed a contempt of Parliament by interfering with a Radio New Zealand journalist as he tried to carry out his work. The Privileges Committee is meeting for two and a half hours tonight and Mr Anderton wants it to hear evidence in public so the public can be assured correct procedures are followed. Politicians are on these committees and they are politicians and I accept that. This is a senior committee however and one could expect that senior members would take the reputation and conduct of the House very seriously indeed and they have to be careful and that the rules of natural justice have to apply. You just can't willy-nilly make any old decision you like. Um, without taking cognizance of the facts. And the second thing is that the Privileges Committee doesn't actually make a decision. It makes a recommendation to the House, and the House makes the decision. The altercation involving Mr Peters and Mr Henare appears to be reflected in the latest TVNZ Coma Brunton poll, which shows support for their party is at its lowest point in almost four years. The poll of 1,000 voters taken last week shows New Zealand First support has dropped another three points over the past month to just 4%. And Winston Peters' popularity in the preferred Prime Minister stakes is also dropping. Just 4% of those polled want him to be in the top job, down 2% on last month, and putting him in fourth equal place with Labour's Mike Moore. It also shows more people disapprove of the Coalition Government's performance, 65% up 16 But in Parliament yesterday, Mr Peters was making confident noises. That's a government that deserves long term to be re-elected, and we're going to be re-elected. And no amount of character assassination, innuendo, personal attack, and resort to vituperation is going to stop this government coming back in 1999. Sir, we are looking forward to the next three years. Tonight's meeting of the Privileges Committee must also resolve a question over its membership, with calls for Prime Minister Jim Bolger to stand aside after he said he believes the matter involving Mr Peters is now closed. Jim Bolger believes he should be on the committee and says he anticipates he will be there, but says there are one or two matters to be clarified. From Parliament for Morning Report, Catherine Street. Three minutes to eight. To Israel, where bulldozers have begun clearing the area where Israel intends to build thousands of new Jewish homes on land on the outskirts of occupied Jerusalem. The move to build 6,500 homes is being condemned by Palestinians who say it'll put an end to the peace process. The Israeli army is on high alert across the West Bank and defiant Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has accused Yasser Arafat of giving a green light to terrorist organisations planning attacks in Israel. The Palestinian side now must choose. Do they want terror or do they want peace? I have made my choice. I want peace. But I will not sacrifice Jerusalem. I will not sacrifice the future of my country. 
in order to uh, rescind only for a moment terrorist threats. That's Benjamin Netanyahu. We're joining us now from uh, Jerusalem, our correspondent Robert Berger. Good evening, Robert. Good evening. Well, you've been there earlier today and um, you will have seen the amount of military build-up and preparation for the bulldozers moving in. What's happened? Well, as you say, massive military build-up on the Israeli side, but the uh, beginning of the building passed quietly. There had been a lot of build-up to uh, today. Uh, Israel had been under tremendous pressure to call the whole thing off, pressure from the United States, the Europeans, and especially the Palestinians. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, and what Netanyahu himself mentioned, there have been a lot of uh, threats from the Palestinian side that if Israel went ahead with this, there could be a major outbreak of violence. It happened a little bit later in the day. The weather was kind of rainy, and so far the Palestinian response has been subdued. In fact, in fact, Yasser Arafat called on his people to not to respond to the building with violence. So, so far it's quiet. We'll see what happens tomorrow. There was a group of MPs at the site who are protesting. What are they there for? Well, these were mostly um, opposition MPs uh, from left-wing parties who opposed the government. They, in fact, uh, stood in front of bulldozers briefly, trying to get to the bulldozers to stop. It's a, a lot of people in the um, in the opposition, uh, which is perhaps 40 percent of Parliament or so, are opposed to this building project. They say it, it was it happened at the wrong time, even though they support. Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem. They say that this was not the right step to take in the peace process. So, uh, but uh, symbolically, they stood in front of the bulldozer, bulldozers, but they didn't really accomplish much. Robert Berger, thanks for your time this morning. And talks on the future of Jerusalem are due to start this week, but in fact have not happened. Netanyahu, of course, has staked his whole political future on the success of this building project. Coming up after eight, what's coming up, Mike? Well, we go to the first day of the election campaign in Britain, and uh, bad news for John Major. The son has deserted him, the Rupert Murdoch's son. They're backing Labour, of course, and the poll came out. Uh, he starts 28 points behind the opposition, the biggest gap in electoral history. But it's still winnable, he says. Wednesday, March the 19th, Jack Parkey, ten times he asked for help, he didn't get it. No help, why? Bill English, next. For the news, Hewitt Humphrey. Good morning. The lawyer for a Levin man convicted of rape says it would not have happened if the man's appeals for psychiatric help had been answered. 30-year-old Jack Parkey was yesterday convicted in the High Court in Palmerston North. Two months ago, he was committed to spend six months in a psychiatric hospital, but was discharged after a day. Parkey then sought psychiatric help ten times, but was turned away each time. His lawyer, Mike Antonovic, told Morning Report, the mental health system failed his client and his victim. He was let down, and I think the, you could argue too that the victim was seriously let down as well. Uh, this was a crime that, in my opinion, need not have happened at all. Uh, had the psychiatric health services been adequately equipped uh, to properly treat this man. Lawyer Mike Antonovic. A consultant psychiatrist with the Mental Health Foundation, Peter McGeorge, has defended the handling of the case by mental health staff. He says Parkey was a difficult case because he had an alcohol and drug problem in addition to his mental illness. Dr McGeorge says there's a shortage of facilities to deal with such people. We desperately need more supervised uh, hostel beds in the community that are adequately staffed with people that really know what they're dealing with and are prepared to do it. Consultant psychiatrist Peter McGeorge. Meanwhile, Health Minister Bill English has ordered an investigation into the case and will be talking to the Director of Mental Health to find out what went wrong. Despite assurances from the Papua New Guinea government, it's still not clear that command of the army has been resolved. Prime Minister Sir Julius Chan yesterday sacked his army commander, Brigadier General Jerry Singirock, after the general called on him to resign for hiring mercenaries to help with the Bougainville rebellion. Port Moresby correspondent Peter Nisi says troops appear to have heeded their former commander's call to accept his sacking and stay in their barracks, and the atmosphere in the capital is relaxed. But he says it's not clear exactly what's happening in the army. Murray Barracks, where um, the former 
commander was is still very much close to the public. Um, no one's coming out, no one's going in. And so while the instruments have been delivered and so forth, no one really knows for sure what's really happening in there other than that a change of command has taken place. Peter Nisi says Sir Julius may charge the former general with treason, and that will inflame his many supporters among the rank and file. Public health officials say meningitis cases are on the rise and the epidemic could be around for another 10 years. A 25-year-old Dunedin athlete died of the disease this week and a Wellington student is in hospital. Both were among more than 100 people who attended the function after the track and field championships in Christchurch three weeks ago. 160 others who have been in contact with the two men have been given preventive antibiotics. The Director General of Public Health, Dr Gillian Durham, told Morning Report the death rate from meningitis has been going up every year since 1991. Unfortunately, when other countries like New Zealand have experienced this situation, the problem can continue for 5 to 15 years, which is why we're having to focus on public education, professional education and a research programme. Gillian Durham says the key message is that anyone with a rash or fever or other flu-like symptoms should see a doctor immediately. As public support for New Zealand first wanes, its leader Winston Peters will tonight begin defending himself against claims that he's in contempt of Parliament. The Privileges Committee will meet to hear evidence relating to an altercation between Mr Mr Peters and John Banks. Alliance leader Jim Anderton has complained about the behaviour of Mr Peters during the late-night altercation. He's also laid a complaint that New Zealand First Deputy Leader Tau Henere tried to stop a Radio New Zealand journalist recording the incident. The events have been followed by a plunge in New Zealand First's political fortunes. A TVNZ Colmar Brunton poll shows support for New Zealand First has sunk to its lowest ever level, 4%, the same as Winston Peters' personal support. Tree-top protesters in West Coast forests are being issued with notices by Timberlands telling them they may bear the brunt of production losses due to their action. Over the past six weeks, members of the Native Forest Action Group have installed themselves on top of Rimu trees in Charleston Forest to protest over logging by the firm. Kit Richards of Timberlands West Coast says protesters are being warned they could face trespass and civil liability damages if they don't move soon. He says the protesters are stopping Timberlands, getting to 600 tonnes of logs worth up to $150,000 each, which are lying in the forest. We want to get the logs out. If their protest makes that impossible and the logs go to waste, then there will have to be uh, not only more trees cut down to replace them, but there will be costs uh, due to the loss of logs on the ground. And we think they should be thinking about that carefully. Kit Richards says Timberlands will cut logs from other Buller area forests if it can't retrieve the ones in Charleston. But the protesters say threats of legal action are just heavy-handed bully tactics and they'll stay in the treetops till logging stops. And that's the news. Hello, I'm Trevor Henry. Each evening I bring you World Watch, extended coverage of significant international issues. Hear the newsmakers. Welcome to 10 Downing Street. And I hope you all enjoy seeing and using the site. Witness events. When we wanted to, uh, to know what was Master's plan, they all said... World Watch, 8 minutes past 6, weekday evenings on National Radio. The Met Service short forecast to midnight tonight. Over the North Island, mostly fine sunny weather, but in the west from Northland to Waitomo, cloudy areas and the odd light shower. In the west of the South Island, rain in Fiordland spreading to southern Westland this evening, a few light showers developing in northern Westland and Buller. In Nelson, Marlborough, Canterbury and Otago, fine except for scattered rain developing about the western ranges of Otago this evening. In Southland, coastal showers turning to more extensive rain tonight. For the Chatham Islands, a few showers at first, but long fine periods developing this afternoon. In Auckland today, cloudy periods, the odd western shower, southwesterly is a maximum of 21 degrees. Wellington today, fine, northerly is 35 kilometres an hour developing, a maximum of 18. Christchurch, fine, northeast winds, a maximum of 19. And Dunedin, fine, westerly is 30 kilometres an hour and a maximum of 15 degrees. Seven minutes past eight. Thank you, Hewitt. Morning Report with Eva Radich and Mike Hosking. Health Minister Bill English says there will be an investigation into the case of Jack Parkey. He sought psychiatric help on ten occasions, at least was turned down every time. Yesterday, he was convicted of rape in the High Court in Palmerston North. Now, Mr English says the system appears to have let down both the victim and the offender, and he will be talking with the Director of Mental Health this morning.
morning about the form the investigation will take. Well, I got in touch with Bill English and I asked him why the system failed. One of the features of this case which uh, throws up an issue that bothers me and that is that our mental health service seems to be organised around the diagnosis that people have rather than the, the clear needs. And uh, I'm sure in this, it uh, looks like in this case the complication would have been that there's a record of drug and alcohol dependency. So what? Now, well, we should be heading for a service where it doesn't actually matter what the diagnosis is. Uh, if the person has a clear need, then, then the service either deals with them themselves or sends them elsewhere. But that's rather, the point of my rather question. Rather than just leaving them Indeed. on the Indeed, that's the point of my question. In 1997, why aren't you running that system? It's not well, complex, is it? Need well, some help, you should be able to get it. One wouldn't have thought so. I've spent the first couple of months as a minister uh, talking to a number, partic- number of groups of people, uh, particularly those who use the mental health services. Uh, I'm surprised to find there is a reasonably clear view about how the services ought to be. Uh, so we need to start making a few decisions that will build on the work that's been done, uh, but work a bit harder to get a service that's much more about the people who need it and a bit less about the people who run it. Well, how is it that the people who do run it get government money, taxpayers' money, when there are two reports? These reports came out in court. City needed long-term psychiatric care. City couldn't manage his medication, yet they discharged him into what the judge termed unsuitable flatting situation. No money, no supervision. I simply don't know the answer to that. That's what we have to find out. But why don't you know the answer to that? This isn't the first time this has happened, is it? Uh, no, it, do- it doesn't happen a whole lot, but um, in this, this case was brought to our attention yesterday by, by the uh, results of the court hearing, and uh, we will have to in- investigate it. Then, but that won't be enough just to investigate it. We will then have to um, be able to give reassurance that, it, that this type of thing won't happen anywhere else in the country, quite apart from what's happened in Palmerston North and Levin. People are going to have to lose their jobs over this, aren't they? Well, that's it to be seen. What, you can think of some sort of set of circumstances where they wouldn't? Well, I just without having the facts, Mike, it's hard for me to uh, draw too many robust conclusions. Well, the facts that are in front of us is a man wanted help, asked ten times at least, stole his mother's car, drove to Palmerston North, asked again. He asked ambulance staff, he asked police. There's a victim who was raped. I... How many more facts do you need? Well, we need, we need to understand the reasons for uh, however that whole range of people reacted to him. I mean, to be turned down by, turned down or turned out by the police, the ambulance service, the local community mental health system and the Palmerston North Hospital, uh, th- there must be something going on there. It doesn't make any sense to us, uh, but I would prefer to have a look at the facts, have someone talk to the people involved. That doesn't. That's <clears throat> not to dodge accountability or anything. It's simply to make sure we do know exactly what happened and that uh, the right kind of action is taken and we don't have a knee-jerk reaction to what is clearly a distressing and tragic circumstance for the victim. See, Justice Goddard wants that reassurance too. Safety considerations do not appear to have been part of the decision. This is to turn them out into the community. I hope such decisions will never be made on that basis again. Can you give Justice Goddard that reassurance? No, I can't right now um, because I don't have a basis on which to give the reassurance. When you get the report, will you be able to? Well, when I get the report, I can see what we can see what <coughs> get some explanation for what went wrong this time. I think we already know what went wrong, but well, we're exactly. Get an Yet you're not giving it. any reassurance. You know what went wrong. Something went the, tragically wrong, didn't it? The ne- yeah, it did. And the next step is going to be to <coughs> to get get it clear that the services that are generally available uh, will actually cope with this situation better in the in the future. And I, I can't give that reassurance yet. What about the argument that this person, A, needs treatment, didn't get it, but B, should be punished because he is a criminal, because he raped, and there's no facility in this country for that? That, that, is, a, that is a genuine problem. There are any number of people in the prison service uh, who need treatment. Some of them are getting it, some of them probably aren't. Uh, and <clears throat> that boundary that's drawn once someone's committed an offence uh, between punishment and treatment is is, is is a difficult issue that government has wrestled with. And Who's working on it? With. Who's working on it? Well, the criminal justice system spent, has spent a lot of time working on projects to be able to treat its prison population, a large number of whom need some sort of treatment. But I think there are there is ahead of us a 
fundamental debate about the, the law and the legislation that applies because what happens at the moment is that people can be treated as long as they don't commit an offence. Once they commit an offence, they're effectively withdrawn from the treatment system and we haven't found a way yet to get round the business of the need for, this, for society to sentence and punish someone and the obvious need of the individual for treatment. The criminal justice system is trying, but we haven't made enough progress yet. Health Minister Bill English, 13 past eight. The New Zealand government has expressed support for Papua New Guinea's democratic government. Australia is a little closer to the action, and Prue Garwood says their reaction in Canberra has been similar. She joins us now. Good morning, Prue. Good morning, Eva. What has John Howard had to say about the events of the last 48 hours? Well, uh, he completely uh, supports the action of Sir Julius Chan. He says that uh, it is a very difficult relationship, uh, but that the government respects the sovereignty of Papua New Guinea. It doesn't, on the other hand, relieve us as Australia uh, from the responsibility of stating our view, he says, if we think something is happening with which we don't agree. But he wants a stable, democratic Papua New Guinea, and uh, I've made it very clear, he says, in Parliament, that uh, we support the right of the Prime Minister to dismiss the commander of the Defence Forces and the unconstitutionality of what the commander of the Defence Forces has done. However, the opposition parties are using this. Ken Beasley is looking for stronger action from Australia and the Democrats have gone so far as to call it the worst regional crisis since Vietnam. I think it is the worst regional crisis since Vietnam and I think uh, people like Ian Sinclair, a former minister in the old coalition government under Malcolm Fraser in the 1970s, uh, has said exactly that. Uh, And I I don't think the government uh, runs away from that. Uh, The difficulty is when you're uh, in opposition and uh, when you're a Democrat, you can afford to say these things, but these people now have to do something about it, so they're being very careful publicly. Uh, I think the, the government... I, I can't believe that uh, the Prime Minister wouldn't have, in his five-hour meeting with Julius Chan over lunch at Kirribilli Lodge in, uh, house in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, that uh, John Howard wouldn't have said to uh, Julius Chan, look, mate, if uh, you use those mercenaries, uh, we'll cut some of our aid budget. They've got a defence cooperation agreement, which is absolutely essential to the development of the Papua New Guinean defence effort. And we are, in addition the largest aid donor to Papua New Guinea. We give them a third of a billion dollars a year. And his words last night were, if those mercenaries are used in Bougainville, there will be quite significant consequences. Of course, he's told this to Sir Julius when he was there, as you say, a couple of weeks ago. It's hard to believe that uh, Sir Julius is ignoring him completely, given the dependence on aid from Australia. Yes, but you see, I suppose Sir Julius Chan apparently has uh, an election to face this year, and this would be good domestic politics. Uh, And Sir Julius Chan is weighing up the two sides of the relationship, uh, as John Howard acknowledges, uh, and I think uh, are undeniable, that uh, on the one hand, Australia is the biggest aid donor, uh, and it was a former, if you like, colony of Australia. On the other hand, we can't afford either in the eyes of Papua New Guinea for domestic political management reasons there, nor really in the eyes of much of the rest of the world, to say, well, you know, we, we're your biggest aid donor, you'll do as we say. I mean, the whole point of independence is that you don't bully uh, countries like that. So Sir so Julius Chan, I suppose, is trading on some of that. But I, I think it is um, uh, quite n- noteworthy that Sir Julius Chan is so prepared to, uh, at this stage at least, ignore the advice. I mean, you don't really know what the mercenaries are being used for. And, I mean, he might uh, he might be absolutely sure that they are not be going to go anywhere where near Bougainville and will only be used for training purposes. But uh, uh, if they are used for anything else, then his defiance is remarkable. Thanks very much for your time this morning. That's Prue Goward, our Australian correspondent. It's 17 past eight. Well, the uh, PNG story all over the front of the Australian papers, as you would expect. The Morning Herald in Sydney says sacked Army Commander Jerry Singerock may be charged with treason. The Australian Financial Review says relations between Australian and PNG worsened, or it's just between Australia and PNG, worsened when Sir Julius Chan refused to rule out the possibility that outside interests ins- inspired the army revolt. Also, the Australian has news independent Senator Mel Colston has been asked to explain more discrepancies in travel allowances, while inside it reports 10 backbench senators have between them been paid more than a million dollars in travel allowances in the past five years. In Britain, the election dominates the papers. The Times reports the leaders hit the campaign trail within hours of the Prime Minister's announcement. It says Mr Major insisted
of the campaign was winnable, but received a double jolt when The Sun announced it was backing Tony Blair, and a Gallup poll for The Daily Telegraph gave Labour a 28-point lead. The Telegraph itself says the Conservatives are further behind in public support than any governing party at the start of an election campaign since opinion polling began before the last World War. And the bookies' odds reflect the polls. The Times says it's currently 8-1 to one against John Major winning an overall majority. And we'll go to Des Fahey in Westminster before nine on that. In Hong Kong, the South China Morning Post updates yesterday's story on a race-fixing scandal in which 37 people have been arrested. It says jockey club bosses promised prompt action, or just prompt action, to save the reputation of racing in the territory. And the Post says the removal of colonial symbols from Hong Kong's Legislative Council building has sparked anger among traditionalists. The New York Times leads with news Anthony Lake has withdrawn his candidacy to lead the CIA after a tawdry time in front of a Senate committee. Mr Lake said he expected the confirmation hearings would drag on, so told President Clinton he was sick of being a dancing bear in a political circus. The Times Times analyses the decision, saying it's a demonstration that something has gone wrong with the way the Senate decides on presidential nominations. And the Times outlines plans by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to streamline that organisation. 18 past 8. Yes, indeed, $123 million, lots of jobs to go. We'll talk to Judy Lessing about that before 9 as well. And meantime, the Navy is categorically denying it offered hush money in defence for sexual harassment cases. Now, this allegation was raised yesterday afternoon in Parliament uh, with Labour's Ross Robertson claiming to have an informant who says a complainant was offered 50000 to keep quiet. Here's Marie Hosking. Ross Robertson linked his claim in Parliament to the sexual harassment allegations surrounding the naval ship Wellington, accusing the Navy of attempting a cover-up using taxpayers' money. Mr Robertson later claimed the source who gave him this information has proved reliable in the past. He says the man tells him the money was only available if the complainants agreed to take the issue no further. The basis of what I have been told was that the money was offered uh, and it was all dependent on whether the uh, complaints went forward or not. Defence Minister Paul East told Parliament he had absolutely no knowledge of such money being offered. Mr Speaker, I would be astonished if the Navy offered such, uh, or anybody in a position of authority, offered such payments to anybody. It's the first I have ever heard of it. It hasn't been raised in any of the correspondence from the Honourable Member on this matter. It's the first I've ever heard of it is him mentioning it today in the House. And I'm very happy to look into the matter for him. A spokesperson for Mr East later said neither he nor the Chief of Defence has any knowledge of these claims and challenged anyone with such information to come forward. The Navy has also issued a denial. Its public relations spokesperson said the suggestion was completely without foundation. However, Ross Robertson is unmoved. He's now calling for an independent inquiry into the matter and is hoping the issue will be pursued at select committee level. From Parliament for Morning Report, Marie Hosking. 20 past eight. Treetop protesters on the west coast say threats of legal action from Timberlands to get them out of a logging area are just heavy-handed bullying tactics. For the past six weeks, members of the Native Forest Action Group have been perched in Rimu trees in Charleston Forest to stop Timberlands logging in that area. Timberlands has issued them with notices saying they may face charges for the costs incurred should 600 tonnes of logs on the forest floor rot while the protesters are there. Timberlands planning manager is Kit Richards and he's with us now. Good morning. Good morning, Eva. Is this basically a, a, a trick to get them out, scare them into leaving? Uh, no, I think what it is is uh, what we're hoping is that they do need some time to consider uh, that there are other alternatives and, and consequences um, arising from the protest. What they have uh, told us is that they are going to maintain a, a protest and uh, try and stop, stop the logging, and we have moved elsewhere uh, and are continuing our operations normally. But the protesters have, have said that we're, they're quite happy to let 600 tonnes rot on the ground. Now, from our perspective, uh, firstly, obviously, we, we don't want to see that happen. We do want to uh, extract that timber if we can because it's already down and prepared. And to not do so simply means another 600 uh, tonnes of live trees have to be, has to be cut somewhere else. But that's fairly but, small fry to you on the that, scale of your operation, isn't it? Just well, one or a, two weeks' work, really. That's right, but at the same time, uh, that, that is a lot of value. And uh, if the protesters um, do uh, prevent us taking that out, then we're, we're really 
trying to give them good warning well ahead of time that there are other potential implications to them and they should be thinking about that over now, the next few weeks. Your legal obligation that you talk about to continue mill- milling, milling rather in the Buller area, what's the nature of that obligation? Well that obligation is, uh, is a, in fact a contractual obligation between the Crown and environmental groups and the industry. It was signed some 10 years ago uh, and it is deemed uh, by courts of law at this time to be a contract. We're an agent for the Crown to make sure that happens. The process is is essentially 88% completed, and what is happening here is that there are some uh, parties who would wish to see that uh, process foreshortened. Um, The the accord allows for certain volumes to be uplifted over certain times and then puts a a finite term by which it must be ended. And uh, the protesters are essentially asking that the, uh, I guess, the taxpayer via the Crown pick up the tab for them wishing to uh, foreshorten that agreement. And uh, I think really it's a matter of uh, ultimately uh, the decisions being made, well, is this a a good priority? Um, If it's going to be stopped or foreshortened, uh, how should that be done? How much uh, is involved? Uh, in terms of where's the money, where would the money come from, vote conservation, um, health, education, uh, or is it better, are there other conservation priorities? And I think the, uh, the trends these days, science and, and policy these days, is telling us that the big sustainability issues in New Zealand are very much closer to home uh, and well away from the, the forests of the West Coast. Well, let's talk about the, the exotic forests that are there, the pine forest. There's plenty of pine there, isn't there? Well, there isn't. Um, the, but the they're pine... sending it down to Christchurch because the Hokitika mill is so busy processing they can't handle it all. No, well, that's incorrect. Um, essentially, there, there is uh, pine forest available and it's come on at more or less exactly the rate uh, and volume predicted under the Accord Agreement or as part of the Accord Agreement. And uh, that was uh, organised as part of a transitional arrangement. Some of that wood always was going to go to other places because it uh, physically cannot be processed on the West Coast and it can't be processed until you uh, reach higher levels of, of resource availability, which happened sometime in the early in the new century, uh, at which time the uh, final phase out of this particular operation is due to... Uh, due to be completed. The conservationists are questioning your commitment to the coast area saying that the West Point, Westport mill had closed just a couple of weeks ago because they missed out on the contract with Timberland. So well, I think what is your commitment to the area? Well, the commitment is, is very strong. Uh, this uh, company's future and our whole objective is, as part of seeing the transitions of the Accord through is for a long-term sustainable industry on the West Coast. The important issue here, though, is that um, there, have been a, there has been a mythology developed about exactly what the Accord meant and uh, many of the arguments that are being raised uh, evolve from that. Uh, those arguments were well tested in the 1995 High Court challenge, and they found essentially that uh, while the agreement was a contract, Timberlands was administering it, or, or the Crown was administering it through Timberlands correctly. And uh, what the accord was about was providing opportunities for the West Coast industry as a whole, not individual sawmills or individual regions. And uh, that, is, that is the fundamental flaw in the argument. And to that extent, uh, this company is, is very determined to see a, a long-term sustainable industry on the West Coast. Thanks very much for that. That's Kit Richards from Timberlands, who's the planning manager there. Well, what does the Native Forest Action Group think of all this? Their spokesperson is Annette Cotter, and she's with us now. Good morning. Good morning. What do you think of their commitment to the West Coast area? Well, I think that um, Timberlands West Coast Limited is a self-serving opinion of uh, what the West Coast Accord means um, for the West Coast. Um, what they've done is that they've, they've passed over the, the, uh, their contract to South Westland, which is a mill that was supposed to have changed over to Pine in the early 1990s. Well, let's look what's happened to you. You've now been served with notices to leave by when? Well, we haven't actually been served with notices. You've been threatened um, with the notice. We've been threatened. What Timberlands have done is that they've, they've imported a tactic known as SLAT, which is Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation. And that's a, a tactic that's been employed by um, a United States big business against small environmental companies. What it basically is is bully tactics. They're trying to use heavy-handed legal terms and threats. Well, you've been there six weeks. Presumably they're just losing their patience with these. They have to get you out somehow. 
Well, w- as they say, 600 tonnes of rimu is rotting. Well, that's a waste in anyone's language, isn't it? Well, what's, uh, nothing's, nothing's been wasted. What's happening now is that the, legal process, uh, the political process is happening in, in, the, um, in Wellington. They're getting worried because the public, um, public opinion is turning against them. How do we know the public opinion's turning? There's no real evidence of that, is there? Well, we've got all the support of the, um, all the Green Party, um, all the conservation groups. We've got um, support of both Labour and Alliance, the two major opposition parties. We've had floods of um, support come in from the general public. Awareness is increasing. People didn't, before our protest, people didn't realise, people didn't know that there was still rainforest logging continuing in, in New Zealand. Thank you very much for your time this morning. That's Annette Cotter. We'll follow that one with interest. It's been going on for many decades now. That's the Native Forest Action Group spokesperson, 28 past eight. You might have to picture this in your mind. Interesting story. A group of Upper Waitaki residents wants three towns and part of the country's fourth largest river shifted out of Canterbury and into Otago. Now, public hearings began yesterday on a community-led proposal to alter the regional boundary divide in Canterbury and Otago. It's the first time they've done this since uh, 88. They originally drawn up these boundaries in 1988. The disputed boundary currently runs along the south bank of the Waitaki River and it splits the Waitaki district between the two regions. So Ray Wynne Rees Jones, she is onto this. She says that's not acceptable to all Waitaki residents. If the proposal succeeds, the Omarama, Kurao and Otamatata townships, plus a significant farming area and part of the Waitaki River, will transfer out of Canterbury and into Otago. The three farmers and two businessmen who are behind the breakaway bid currently reside in that part of the Waitaki district that's within the Canterbury region. Omarama farmer Tim Wardell explains why they'd rather be in Otago. At present the Waitaki district council has to deal with um, two regional councils and from the figures that we've gained that's at least an inefficiency cost to the ratepayers of $150,000. When the boundary was um, drawn up in 1989 it was done on watershed or catchment, and there was no consider- consideration taken for community of uh, common interest, which in the case of the Upper Waitaki, Omara, Marita, Matata and Kurao is, is Omaru, and therefore by definition Dunedin. And there just seems to be a general feeling within the community that we would be um, better served and more comfortable with the Otago Regional Council. Keen to expand, the Otago Regional Council supports the proposal. The Chief Executive Graham Martin says it's what the community wants. This council has had um, expressions of concern from citizens in that area since 1989 when both regional councils were formed. The community wants a change and the Otago Regional Council has put in a submission saying yes, it supports the change, because we can make the change work better for local government in that area and it fits better with our regional council's activities in the rest of Waitaki District. But the Canterbury Regional Council, which stands to lose part of its area should the proposal be accepted, is opposed to any boundary change. The chairman, Richard Johnson, says effective resource management is best achieved within existing river catchment boundaries. If you divide them down the middle of a river, you lose complete control. You have a joint committee, and in the past there have been joint committees that have tried to manage these resources, and they never work out. They are captured by um, petty uh, issues of um, parochialism on either side, and um, there's not true accountability or transparency. Forty submissions on the proposed boundary reorganisation have been received. One includes a petition signed by 430 people in support of the change. The Canterbury Regional Council has already won the first battle to oversee the breakaway debate and three of its councillors will start hearing submissions today. A final decision isn't expected until June. In Christchurch, Raywin Rees Jones. Just after Hubber State and Kim is with us. What's on the programme today, Kim? Morning, Eva. What becomes of the broken and dangerous in our society? We'll be having a further look at the story that you've been covering extensively this morning. I'll talk to ex British Labour Party high flyer, now Vice Chancellor of Waikato University, Brian Gould, about the uh, forthcoming election in Britain. Uh, Labour's tip to win. Maybe he should have stuck around. And I'll talk to Richard North Patterson just after 11 o'clock. He's one of the new and hugely successful genre of writers in the United States, lawyers turned authors. All right. Turn your microphone on, Michael. Coffee and Arn's had the job for a few months now in New York. He's had a bit of a think about it. He's got this huge problem. You see, the Americans owe him a billion dollars, uh, and they're not going to pay it until he gets his uh, 
Act sorted out. So he's going to trim $123 million, a whole pile of jobs at the UN, and Judy Lessing is going to be covering this for us. British election, something on that, and these wonderful balloons in Hamilton. You know the front page of the phone book, that cow balloon? That's my personal favourite. But this year they have a kookaburra balloon, a kiwi balloon, and an upside-down balloon. Think about that. Uh, we'll talk to our reporter, Jason Rhodes, who is covering the Balloon Festival. News now with Hewitt Humphrey. The Health Minister Bill English admits he can't explain why a mentally ill man was denied psychiatric help ten times before committing a rape. 30-year-old Jack, o- Jack O'Parkey was yesterday convicted of rape in the High Court in Palmerston North. Two months before that, he'd been committed to spend six months in a psychiatric hospital, but was discharged after a day. He then sought psychiatric help ten times, but was turned away each time. Bill English told Morning Report that he's ordered an investigation into the Parkey case and says at the moment he can't give an assurance the same situation won't happen again. Despite assurances from the Papua New Guinea government, it's still not clear that command of the army has been resolved. Prime Minister Sir Julius Chan yesterday sacked his army commander, Brigadier General Jerry Singirock, after the general called on him to resign for hiring mercenaries to help with the Bougainville Rebellion. Port Moresby correspondent Peter Nisi says troops appear to have heeded their former commander's call to accept his sacking. But he says it's not clear exactly what's happening in the army and no one has been allowed in or out of any barracks. Hundreds of Israeli troops are standing guard as bulldozers move in to level the ground for a new Jewish settlement in disputed East Jerusalem. The building is going ahead despite Palestinian warnings that the project will spark violence and destroy the peace process. Soldiers and paramilitary police have been deployed around the hilltop construction site at Jebel Abu Naim to keep protesters at bay. Public health officials say meningitis cases are on the rise and the epidemic could be around for another 10 years. A 25-year-old Dunedin athlete died of the disease this week and a Wellington student is in hospital. Both were among more than 100 people who attended a function after the track and field championships in Christchurch three weeks ago. The Director-General of Public Health, Dr Gillian Durham, says the death rate from meningitis has been going up every year since 1991. A TVNZ Colmar Brunton poll shows support for New Zealand First has sunk to 4%, its lowest ever level. The poll comes as New Zealand First leader Winston Peters prepares to defend himself to the Privileges Committee tonight against claims that he's in contempt of Parliament. The Alliance leader Jim Anderton has complained about the behaviour of Mr Peters during a late-night altercation with MP John Banks. Treetop protesters in West Coast forests are being issued with notices by Timberlands telling them they may bear the brunt of production losses arising from their action. Members of the Native Forest Action Group have installed themselves on top of rimu trees in Charleston Forest to protest against logging by Timberlands. The protesters claim that logging in Buller is unsustainable and say they'll stay put in the trees until it stops. An Australian tourist has been trampled to death by an elephant in the Chiang Mai province in northern Thailand. Witnesses say the man went to feed the elephant with bananas when it grabbed him with its trunk, threw him on the ground and crushed him. Now the weather around the country today in Whangarei, fine 21. Auckland, cloudy periods, the odd shower 21. Hamilton and Tauranga, fine 20 to 21. Rotorua and Taupo, fine 18 to 19. Gisborne, Napier, Hastings, fine 21, 22. New Plymouth and Palmerston North, cloudy periods 18 to 19. Wanganui, Masterton, Wellington and Nelson, fine 18 to 19. Blenheim, morning cloud clearing 21 degrees. Greymouth, increasing cloud 17. Christchurch, fine 19. Queenstown, high cloud 17. 17 and Timaru fine, Dunedin fine 15 and in Vicargill occasional showers 16 degrees. 24 minutes to 9. Thanks, Stuart, and you're listening to Morning Report. Time for Sport Now with Andrew Dewhurst. Good morning. Good morning. It's been made clear to the New Zealand Sevens rugby squad that they're the team to beat at the World Cup tournament in Hong Kong this weekend. The New Zealand side played a warm-up match against Portugal yesterday, and Owen Scrimmager says even though it wasn't supposed to be competitive, there was no love lost. You might score a try, but they'll chase you right to the end, you know, and then even tackle you over the line, stuff like that. It, it's... Uh it's a big thing for them to train against us, you know, and it's good for us because uh, they try really hard and expose us in areas and, and we got time to work on it before the tournament starts. 
And British Lions rugby manager Fran Cotton says moves are afoot to take England and France out of the Five Nations Championship and create an alternative tournament along with Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. Cotton says the moves instigated by England are designed to improve its chances of winning the World Cup. The overseas riders don't appear to be having any problems with the terrain in the International Women's Cycle Tour of the Waikato. Australian and Americans fill the top four places and leader Anna Wilson of Victoria leads by four seconds from Didi Demet of the USA. The leading New Zealander is Jacinta Coleman in fifth place, 44 seconds down on the leader. Martin Pettigrew is the best placed New Zealander after two rounds of the Australian Amateur Golf Champs in Perth. Pettigrew is lying second equal on four under par, one shot behind the leader, Wayne Persky of Queensland. Super League's radical new judicial system will come under the microscope for the first time tonight when Canberra and New Zealand prop Quentin Pongia answers a high tackle charge. Pongia pleaded not guilty yesterday to a Grade 3 reckless high tackle on Canterbury lock Steve Reardon and was ordered to appear before the tribunal in Sydney tonight. The Kiwi International was offered the chance to plead guilty and accept a five-week ban and have his slate wiped clean when the charge was downgraded from Grade 4 to 3. But he decided to defend himself and run the risk of a stiffer penalty. And that's sport. Thank you very much, Andrew. It is 22 minutes away from nine. The first day of the British election campaign saw both John Major and Tony Blair heading the campaign trail, but the big stories of the day came from the shifting stances of some of the country's newspapers. The Sun, which is the biggest seller, they claim to have been a big influence on the Conservatives' last return to power. They announced that they'll be supporting Labour, and uh, more importantly, Tony Blair this time around. Once again, Des he has been covering this one for us. Morning, Des. Good morning, mate. The role of the media in all of this, how much power and influence do they have? Well, it depends on who you believe. If you believe the newspapers, they've uh, got an enormous amount of power and a somewhat celebrated headline The Sun wrote after the 92 election, it was The Sun What Won It. Now, uh, initially, people like Neil Kinnock, the defeated Labour leader, and some of his lieutenants agreed with that. But uh, later analysis showed that actually there were as many readers of the Labour-supporting Daily Mirror newspaper who also voted Tory. So it's a bit difficult to construe just exactly what their message is. In this particular instance, I think you could reasonably suggest that um, this is a newspaper, along with a number of others that are now starting to hedge their bets, who are looking at the opinion polls. Uh, They see Labour well out in front and uh, they don't want to be out of tune with their readers. That's uh, not the sort of thing that is good policy for any newspaper. The other blow, of course, was the poll, 28 points behind. How do you come back from that? Well, this is what all the pollsters and uh, the pundits are saying at the moment. It's an impossible hill to climb. Uh, John Major dismisses these as he dismissed uh, the the polls after the last election. Says, look at that, they got it wrong. The pollsters are really uh, on their mettle this time round. Uh, they did get it wrong in '92. They do admit that, but they say that they've uh, they've caught up with the the process. They've tried to iron out the bugs. The problem last time round was that. Uh, they had too many don't knows, and those people weren't really don't knows. They were more didn't have the courage to say, and uh, that meant that the Tory vote was not really accounted for properly. They feel that they've got that ironed out one way or another, but uh, if they get it wrong this time, then they really are going to be in trouble. Labour's windfall tax looks uh, looks fertile ground. Similar debate held in this country over uh, utilities who make huge profits, especially utilities owned by foreign companies. This sounds interesting for Labour. It is going to be difficult. We got a little bit more revealed, but not a lot today, when Gordon Brown suggested that, uh, for example, British Telecom will be one of the ones that will uh, come in for the windfall tax. Now, uh, this is a highly successful company. Uh, It's um, privatised successfully, and uh, it's one of the ones that the Tories say, well, you know, look at this, what's going to happen to your telephone bills as soon as uh, they impose this windfall tax? Up they'll go and uh, it'll equally hit pension plans and the investment plans of a lot of other people. So uh, it's going to be quite a difficult one for Labour to play, but they've uh, had a report from a select committee suggesting that the way the uh, various utilities were privatised meant that um, the benefits didn't really come to the customer and the consumer. Most of them went to the shareholders. The only problem is that the people who were shareholders and did get that benefit aren't the shareholders now because they sold them and got out. We'll stay in touch, dear Fahey, in Westminster, the, uh, the windfall tax, basically, by the way. If the Labour Party decides you make too much profit, they'll cream a little bit off and spit it round. Uh, Paddy Ashdown, the forgotten man of this whole campaign, the big scrap today is also uh, whether he'll take part in the leaders' debate. Uh, John Major didn't think it was necessary that he turn up for that, just the two main players. Uh,
Blair and himself. Uh, so the ongoing argument over that as well. 19 to 9. The most senior official ever to defect from North Korea is now in the Philippines after arriving by air from China. The defector, Wang yong Yop had taken refuge in the South Korean consulate in Beijing five weeks ago. His transfer is seen as an attempt by China not to offend either North or South Korea. Charles Scanlon reports from the South Korean capital, Seoul. The defector was finally smuggled out of Beijing after more than a month of negotiations between South Korea and China. The South Koreans had wanted Huang jong yok to go directly to Seoul, but China insisted that he go via a third country out of consideration for the feelings of its North Korean allies. Officials in Seoul have refused to confirm the reports that the defector was flown to an airfield north of the Philippine capital, Manila. But they say he is now secure and under their control with the cooperation of a third country. The secrecy is due to continuing concern for Mr Huang's safety. South Korean officials are not convinced the North has accepted the defection and they're anxious to guard against the possibility of an attack. Huang jong yop is the first member of the North Korean leadership ever to ask for asylum in the South and he'll be able to supply invaluable intelligence material to the South Korean authorities. Out of deference to China, they're not expected to bring him to Seoul immediately. Some reports say they could delay the transfer for up to a month. China had tried to extract a pledge from South Korea not to exploit the defection for political reasons, and it's unclear how Mr. Huang will be handled once he arrives. Defectors are normally paraded by the intelligence agency at a news conference and are considered important assets in the propaganda war against North Korea. Charles Scanlon reporting from the South Korean capital, Seoul. 17 to 9. I should have mentioned a moment ago that uh, on the uh, British elections and things uh, British that uh, my old mate Jeffrey's in Britain at the moment and he's going to be on the programmes uh, tomorrow uh, to tell us what he's been doing. He went to a Super League game. I think we had to explain what Super League was before he went, but uh, I understand he enjoyed it once he got there. So he'll tell us about that. And he's been on the Channel Tunnel and he's following the election campaign, all that good stuff on the programme tomorrow. Anyway, the UN organisation will soon be a leaner, meaner machine if a proposal from the Secretary General is passed by the General Assembly. Kofi Annan has proposed cutting staff and slashing $123 million from the budget as a first step towards reforming the world body. Under pressure, of course, from the US to begin reforms as soon as possible, Mr Anand also proposed cutting administrative costs by a third by the year 2001. So is not going to work is the big question. Judy Lessing is at the UN. Morning, Judy. Good morning, Mike. Bit of perspective on this. What's $123 million to the UN? Big bickies or no big deal at all? Uh, well, it is so. It is big bickies because the the budget is uh, for for the two years is only about two billion, and you take uh, you know more than a hundred million out of uh, one hundred and twenty three million out, um, and you know that, uh, that that's quite significant in a relatively small budget. Um, I would point out, however, that that one hundred and twenty three million. Uh, and they're already in a zero growth budget. That was proposed uh, last August by Boutros Boutros Ghali in a paper, and uh, it is something that the current Secretary General thought was a good idea, so he's picked it up and he's running with it. So he's got to go to the General Assembly and say, what do you think? And they turned Boutros Ghali down, didn't they? Well, they turned him down, but not on that. Um, I think that uh, it, there was a lot of manoeuvring. I mean, that was a position paper that Boutros Ghali put forward, and there was a great deal of manoeuvring to get a budget. Um, but we will, we will just have to see what the Fifth Committee, which deals with budgetary matters, um, and what the Expert Committee, and we have a New Zealander on that, Denise Almeo, what they have to say. Um, but I would imagine that they would be accepting the idea of cutting, uh, provided, of course, it doesn't hurt anybody um, individually. And, you know, people are very touch you about that. He is putting forward the proposal fundamentally because he believes in it or because he is in deep trouble with the US? I would say both. I think he really does believe in reform. He says it's not an end in itself. It's a way of making the UN uh, much more responsive and more efficient, and I think that's fair. I mean, I don't think the UN is bloated, and I don't think that there are too many people in general, but you can always find areas where there are just too many people, or sometimes uh, too many people all doing the same job when a couple of people could do it. But I do think he is committed to reform. He's been in the organization. He knows what doesn't work. He's had to work with what doesn't doesn't work, and I think he's learned his lesson. Is it enough to impress the US to dig deep into their pockets and pull the money out? Uh, yeah, well, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, after he announced all of this yesterday, um, he had a phone call, he made two phone calls, one to Jesse Helms, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and one to the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Uh, we have only had reaction from, the, um, uh, from Jesse Helms' office, where one of his spokesmen said it's a good first step in the right direction, but the Senator still wants to make sure that the cuts are real. And you know something, I think that means 
that it doesn't matter how much Bill Clinton says, I'm sitting here with my hand on my pen and I want to write you a check. Um, I don't see Jesse Helms' Senate committee uh, giving him the go-ahead for quite some time. And when they do say, yes, go ahead, if they do, it's going to be for a relatively small amount. My guess is about 100000 um, and then the, uh, the other 900000 which is back dues. We're not even talking about current money. Uh, could take a couple of years to come. In the meantime, the UN just has to struggle on. Uh, here's how I understand understand it. The United States, uh, they want their dues cut to 20% of the total, which means that somebody like Europe and Japan would have to pick up the difference. They don't want to pick up the difference unless the US guarantees the payment. Meantime, Germany and Japan, they don't want to pay more unless they get a permanent seat. That's a fair comment. I think that's absolutely right. Um, there may be some nuances around there, but Mike, you've hit it on the head. Well, how do you work through a problem like that? Um, it's going to be hard. I mean, first of all, cutting the assessment of the United States is not something the Secretary General does. The members do that. And there is already a committee working on the scale of assessments, as it's called, and um, they don't seem to be getting anywhere. So I don't know where you go with that one. Yep. Uh, the Security Council reform, which would get perhaps Germany and Japan on it, and then they might cough up some more money. Well, that's a bit stymied, too, because not everybody wants them on. Or they want to be on themselves, and they say, if those two guys go on, we want to be on. How much of a personal test is this for Kofi Annan himself? How much is this me standing up, here's my idea, and I'm going to make this thing work? Oh, a lot. I mean, he's the head, he's the administrative head of this organization, and he really has to make it work somehow or other. He's got some very good ideas. He's cutting some departments. He's consolidating. Um, he's making the UN a great deal, or he hopes to make the UN a great deal more useful out in the countries where it actually does a great deal of work and development and aid and that sort of thing. Um, that sort of thing is, relatively speaking, easy. It's trying to get these countries, and when we say 185, it isn't that it's a small group of powerful countries with big budgets and big voices. Always good talking with you, Judy. Judy Lessing at the New Inn in uh, just the UN in New York. It's 11 to 9. Department of Conservation staff on Codfish Island are anxiously monitoring the first kakapo chick to hatch there since 1992. The Codfish Island kakapo breeding program is part of a national recovery effort at saving the rare birds. Kakapo were once common on the mainland, but their numbers have been decimated by introduced predators such as rats, stoats and wild cats. The kakapo recovery manager Paul Jensen joins us now. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Paul. Hello. Hi. Now, I guess there was much celebration at this first uh, baby to be hatched. Oh, that's right. Um, it, it's quite a milestone uh, in Kākāpō recovery to have our uh, first chick hatch. And um, as you can imagine, we were quite uh, quite pleased about the event. Why is it so difficult? I beg your pardon? Why is the whole process so difficult for the Kākāpō? Well, well, Kākāpō um, are an unusual species. They breed um, every four to five years. And because they're so long-lived, it is likely that uh, they don't feel that there's any pressure on them to produce more than one or two chicks in their lifetime. And uh, so we're in a critical stage with Kākāpō recovery. Um, obviously, we have very few birds, and we'd just like to have them speed up a little. Was this the first, this is the first of one of many this season, or not? Well, I don't know if it's going to be, uh, we're going to produce many chicks this, this season. What, what we currently have is uh, six nests on Codfish Island, and amongst those, we have 12 eggs. Now, we have been going through a process called candling, and that's where a light is shone through the egg to have a look at um, uh, whether the embryo is developing inside. And at this stage, um, we have done eight of those 12 eggs, and four of them have proved to be uh, fertile, and another four have proved to have either dead embryos in them or are infertile. So... Um, at this stage, we're 50-50. Um, we have 50% of our eggs which are good and 50% of our eggs which are bad, and we've got another four to go, so it'll be interesting to see how those pan out. Cindy, the mother of the, the live kakapo that hatched just in the last day or two, she had two eggs. The other one died while it was hatching. Why is that period so difficult for well, the birds? Well, actually, she had three eggs. Uh, Cindy had three eggs, and um, as we've um, gone through the events of her nest, it would appear that one of her eggs actually died at a mid-stage. Um, the embryo died inside the egg, and bacteria <coughs> had uh, built up in that egg, which possibly infected the second egg, which died shortly, well, just at the hatching time. So, um, you know, this is... <laughs> it's good news that she can have three fertile eggs. It's bad news that this bacterial infection um, possibly 
um, terminate the life of the of the second chick. But the, the um, first few weeks of the life of the chicks is a very difficult time, isn't it? Well, that's right. Uh, it's critical that that um, these chicks are fed regularly, and um, Cindy now with one chick is able to um, support that chick rather well. I'm just reviewing the tapes at the moment, looking at uh, the footage that we've got out of Cindy's nest, and she's feeding about every hour for a 10-minute period each hour. So, how closely involved are the staff on monitoring the progress? Well, the, the staff are, are camped um, 60 metres away from uh, these nests and uh, they actually watch what's going on on a little TV monitor. They don't intervene at the nest unless something drastic goes wrong and at this stage, um, with our, our rat control program around the nest and our close monitoring, we have found no significant problems that we can do anything about anyway. So um, we're quite happy with what's going on with our monitors. But do the birds mind your presence? Does well, it make them anxious? No, I mean, that's the great thing with uh, having these little spy cameras uh, in a nest and you're parked 60 metres away. You can see exactly what they're doing without influencing what they do at all. Now, only 50 adult kākāpō survive on the offshore islands, Little Barrier Maud and Codfish. How many more do we need to make their, their success continue? Well, what, what we really need is um, some, some young birds uh, to, to actually come on tap and some young females would be great. What we have is a population which is ageing um, and we only know the age of three of our birds, well, four of our birds if you count this little chick at this stage. So we have a population which is likely to be towards the, um, the, the old end of uh, their breeding life and we have very few young birds. So even if we didn't have more than 50 kākāpō, it would be great to have um, most of them being young. Thank you very much for your time this morning and wish you success with the continuation of the breeding programme. Paul Jansen of the Kākāpō Recovery Programme. Well, I don't know. I reckon a camera would make me a bit nervous, but then that's just me, shy. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Maud Island was mentioned. Remember that uh, one of our regional reporters, Robin Kuby, she visited Maud Island in the Marlborough Sounds to see how this breeding programme's going there. The call of the kākāpō is a sound that's no longer heard in mainland New Zealand forests. Kākāpō is the world's heaviest parrot, weighing up to three and a half kilograms and handsomely attired in mottled green plumage. Maud Island is home to eight adult kākāpō. A Maud Island dock officer, Jason Mallam, says the birds all carry radio transmitters but mostly roam free. He says dock's main role is ensuring the islands remain predator free and that the birds have plenty to eat. We have a supplementary feed program going with all the um on all the islands, on this island anyway, the, the birds are given um, various nuts, almonds, walnuts and um, safflower, sunflower and pumpkin seed and also at various times of the year they get fed um, apple and coomera and also um, sweet corn. The aim of that is to um, get the birds into better condition so that they're more, more able or more likely to breed and then hopefully um, stimulate them into breeding more than the once every four to five years, which they do now. A dock assistant, Joe Mellum, says kākāpō tend to keep to themselves, but they're unique birds to deal with. The thing I, I notice the most about the birds and handling the birds and being near them is, is the smell. They have the most wonderful, sweet, pungent smell, and it's, it's quite special. It's like nothing I've ever smelt before. In fact, if you were to collect feathers, which we do when we're doing our supplementary feed run, we also keep an eye on um, any sorts of natural feeding sign or feathers, because at this time of the year they're molting, so we collect the feathers to keep an eye on their molt. And if you place a feather in a warm place on a sunny windowsill for a couple of minutes and then smell it, you can actually smell that same smell. It's quite neat. Jason Mellon says there's been no breeding success yet from the four female and four male kākāpō living on Maud Island. He says it's difficult to know which birds will breed because kākāpō live for at least 60 years and not much is known about their fertility. But he says the captive bred five-year-old female bird Hoki has the best chance of success. Yeah, I guess we have got our hopes pinned on Hoki. Um, the other birds that we've got here, I think a lot of them are, are older birds, so they, they could in fact be past optimum breeding age. So yeah, Hokie's our real linchpin here, being, being such a young bird. She's been very closely monitored, more closely monitored than any of the other birds.
Jason Mullum says Maud Island's other well-known resident is the mild-mannered Richard Henry, the last surviving kākāpō from Fiordland. For Morning Report, Robin Cuby. 429, the New Zealand hot air balloon fiesta has begun in Hamilton with 32 balloons from around this country and around the world taking part. Jason Rhodes is on balloon duty for us this morning. Morning, Jason. Good morning, Mike. 32 balloons must make four a spectacular sight. It certainly has indeed. It sort of, it sort of turned the city into a bunch of kids again. Everybody's rushing out of buildings and saying, oh, there goes that balloon, there goes this one. The shapes of kookaburra and a kiwi and a cookie bear have floated by just recently, and the balloons have sort of made their, a northern track over the city. I was going to say, would you get a good view? Because not many high-rise buildings in Hamilton, are there's, there? There's not. There's been a few people up on one or two roofs, but generally all you need to do is walk out a door and look skywards. In fact, I'm waiting for a few sort of nose-to-tail prangs and uh, city intersections yeah. this morning. I was looking at, uh, it's the phone book. The balloon made the phone book, didn't it? That it wonderful did. cow balloon, the cow. Frisian yeah. cow. Yes, indeed. Is Very the Frisian back this year? I haven't seen it floating by this morning, but um, I'm sure it being the Waikato, a cow would have to be one of the balloons up in the air. You need good conditions? You do, and the perfect conditions this morning. Just a slight breath of wind, but that's enough, and the balloons of some one or two of them are now starting to land down the northern end, and they basically just look for any big, big patch of grass or a big open space, and they land. One or two have gone down in schools, mm. and so the kids are now out looking at the balloons. And so you also have the cars that trail these balloons, don't you? Don't you have people sort of keeping an eye on the balloon so there they is. can... There is chase cars, yes, that, that basically follow them and, and get to where they land and then pack them up and take them to where they're taking off from next. All right, you'll need to uh, paint me a picture of this. You said a kiwi balloon. I, I think I can work that one through. It looks like a kiwi, am I right it in does. saying? Yes, okay. indeed. As yes. opposed to a New Zealand or a uh, kookaburra? The kookaburra, it's, an ama- it's absolutely ginormous. I'd hate to think what the size of it or how much material is involved, but it actually squawks or sings like a kookaburra as it goes overhead. Um, it, it's sorry? It squawks or sings like a kookaburra. I'm not going to imitate what it sounded like, but... <laughs> It's, Why not? <laughs> We're paying you for this, eh? <laughs> so anyway, so, so it's got a, like a speaker and it makes a kookaburra noise. It makes a kookaburra noise. Mm. And um, Cookie Bear went over the top. That's pretty self-explanatory. And apparently sure. cookies are coming out of that one at various stages as well. I read one of your stories. I've lost it momentarily, but it was the Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, it's like a bunch of books. It's uh, like a massive book, basically, yes. And that, that one's from the States. A huge book balloon. A huge book balloon, See, don't yes. you have, um, I don't know, do you know much about balloons themselves, the uh, the aerodynamics? Because, I mean, a book square, would a square balloon work? It, it, there's all shapes and sizes of them. I don't know how they actually make some of these shapes to actually fly. The basket at the bottom of them, of the, bottom of them and the big round ones seem to be quite big baskets, but the... The kookaburra and um, the roll of egg for film and ones like those are a lot smaller and I think they've managed to get the balance that way and you just hear this massive whoosh of propane gas being yeah. fired up into the balloon. Where do these people buy them? I mean, I, where, do you, where do you go to get a kookaburra balloon, mate? I think that one's come from Australia, actually, for this event. OK. But, um, no. Where would you go to get a kiwi balloon made? Would you get one here or are they some sort of international company? Do we know or not? Uh, unsure, Mike. Um, very much unsure. I think they almost, almost are made to order. That um, if you want a kiwi balloon, that's something you get. And a lot of, I mean, the city council here has actually backed, has actually brought the kookaburra over as a bit of a trans-Tasman exchange. And I'm wanting to sort of highlight wildlife and the zoo and things like this in the city. So the balloon fiesta actually serves a number of purposes by the shapes of balloons that are here. And who are these people who own them? Are these people that would stand out in the street? For example, are uh, just regular, everyday people who happen to like balloons? I think they are regular, everyday people. There's, there's a, a very strong club here in the Waikato. And there's some enthusiasts, um, one of the... the, the uh, balloonist from the States this morning, he's basically going around the world flying his balloon. Great stuff. And um, they have great fun. Good to talk to you, Jason. Jason Rhodes, who was uh, at the Balloon Fiesta. I could have done a kookaburra, because I befriended one on holiday over Christmas. Three used to come and sit on a tree stump outside the restaurant at night and look at us. And they eat uh, only chicken and beef, was the uh, story the waitress was telling us. Uh, This is the Kiwi, though. Have a good day. Radio New Zealand News. Good morning, I'm Hewitt Humphrey. Health Minister Bill English says he can't explain why a mentally ill man was denied psychiatric help ten times before committing a rape. 30-year-old Jack O'Parkey was convicted in the High Court in Palmerston North yesterday. Two months earlier, he'd been committed to spend six months in a psychiatric hospital, but was discharged after a day. Parkey then sought psychiatric help ten times, but was turned away each time. Bill English says he can't say what went wrong and is trying to get more information before he takes any action. That's not to dodge accountability or anything. It's simply to make sure we do know exactly what happened and that uh, the right kind of action 